is Kyumku. It is the old you, Iweriko. Inomotu Otunum Isara Bear Aukunan Awizi Yedakunam Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Fumito Ueda Podcast. I am your regular host, Albert, and today I am joined by my co-hosts, Logan and Mr. Nick Sutner, writer of Shadow of the Colossus, the book from 2015. Welcome, Mr. Sutner. Thanks kindly. Thanks for having me on. There you go. Um, I do have fun with writing, uh, you know, Nick, writer of Shadow of the Colossus, and I just leave it off. It's like... But from, from the, the book, the book from 2015, of course, you know. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a weird weird name for the books in the series, but I guess it does the trick. But I love it, and for me, really, and this is no smoke blowing at all. I, I gain nothing from stroking egos or just like going into superlatives or hyperbole. Um, they are inextricably linked to each other. Your book and this title for me, uh, Nick. It's true. I, I have to I, got to say. That's that's very kind of you, and I I really appreciate it. Um, <laughs> it you know for me, it's such like a yeah, personally, it, it is something where the, the game is like such a big part of my life. So um, the fact that I was able to write something on it, I feel very lucky. And I'm really glad to hear it's had, you know, any any effect on people. So um, yeah. I appreciate it. It was not only just in the words, really, of like how you phrased yourself throughout the book. But um, I mean, I read it to my girlfriend. She does um, sort of like emotional intelligence kind of work as well. Um, mm-hmm. She uh, sort of uh, deals with like nature of meaning, nature of like this, this aspect of psychology, spirituality. I read her one passage uh, from your book. I think it was a about um, the primal, you said something about a, something from a primal dream um, mm-hmm. in the beginning, and she just said, "This this guy, this guy knows. This guy, this guy, this guy woke kind of thing." <laughs> 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 and I was like, and and again, she's like, she my, my thanks to her. No, absolutely, I'll pass that on. And she also says that you are giving off very strong torment vibes from uh, from uh, Game of Thrones. So there you go. Oh, nice. No, okay, yeah, I, I have gotten that one before. <laughs> I, don't, I dig it. So you are the perfect balance between Wallace and Gromit and Tormund. Does that make you feel good, Mr. Setner? I'll take it, yeah, that works. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, Logan, how have you been, my friend? I've been pretty good. Um, unfortunately, I haven't really had time to read much of the book. Uh, I read the first couple chapters, um, but I will say that I have read uh, An Extraordinary Story, which is amazing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. A beautiful collaboration between uh, you, Mr. Setner, and uh you know gen design um really amazing piece of work i I display it on my uh dresser almost like a like some sort of collectible yeah Uh, it is awesome thanks i'm I'm glad you've read it it's it's funny the difference between the two books because that one i think is such a really nice show piece and i didn't quite know what to expect but working with future press on it too just they do really beautiful stuff like when i received it, it it just made it really real and i was like wow this is such a beautiful thing whereas the boss fight books uh the physical book it um it's a nice book. It's got a really good, good hand feel. Um, yeah. But it's much more of like, you know, it's a small production thing. And it's much more like my own personal thing. Whereas the yeah. last Guardian book is more sort of, you know, like an art book behind the scenes thing. So they're, they're very different, but I was uh, very lucky to get to work on both ends of that spectrum. Yeah. I will say that the, the format actually for each of them suits what they each are perfectly because, um, you know, the, like at first glance, you see, you know, Shadow of the Colossus, that book on a, on a, on a coffee table, you'd think it was, you would look at it and think, oh, that's a travelogue. That's like a book that you bring with you, like, uh, you know, Lonely Planet right. kind of thing. Um, so, and that really is very much what it does for that, for the game itself. So I think that kind of suits it. It is, and I, 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 um, I put this in the message to you when I uh, did up the business card and like the, all that stuff. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> I'm really glad you like those. But um, yeah, uh, on the board... I, I'm, I'm even impressed with your sh- your show notes are like an opus. Oh, cheers! <laughs> We're on about their to... own. Yeah, I appreciate it. We're about to dive into it. That's kind of what we like to have kind of an opening chat here. Um, again, emphasis yeah. on the coziness and on the just like ah, you're on for me to a uh-huh. podcast now. This is like you know <laughs> the, the games themselves. Even though there's that aspect of kind of a little bit eerie, a little bit otherworldly there's this comforting um aspect to them and we kind of wanted to carry that into the, the show itself you know 
Yeah, you're just trying to poke around in his brain a bit. That's right. That's right. Um, speaking of um, what Nick was just um, talking about with uh, our kind of opening, um, I'll crack on with that if that's cool. Um, let's go for it. So. The artist Fumito Ueda, who created Ico, Shadow of the Colossus, and The Last Guardian, is currently leading his new studio, Gen Design, in developing a new title, The Girl and the Sleeping Giant, as we've come to call it. Each week, we chronicle the creation of this forthcoming adventure in the form of weekly news, informed and wild speculation, analyses, and more. Interwoven with reporting on and breaking down any and all new developments, we are also revisiting Ueda's first three titles, starting with Shadow of the Colossus, followed by Ico, and concluding with The Last Guardian. In doing so, we endeavor to compile a fully comprehensive archive of material, long-form, in-depth analyses and discussions on each character, creature, and location, personal stories from fellow appreciators of Ueda's work, interviews, theories, interpretations, and much, much more. The time has now come for Mr. Ueda's unmatched and inimitable form of ongoing storytelling, world-building, and overall contribution to the artistic validity and power of this medium, the most profoundly moving and life-affirming art form ever, to receive a thorough, intimate, and loving chronicle, now and for posterity, from the very community that is so embraced, cherished, celebrated, and resonated with the man, his team, and their work for close to two decades. We wish to thank you for the privilege of your time in listening in and joining us on this adventure. With that regular rundown out of the way, let's get the show started. Fantastic. Now let us dive right back into right. what we were doing, catching up. So, how has your week been, uh, Mr. Sutner, just in general, but also tying into anything with Shadow of the Colossus, Fumito Ueda? Go for it. Oh, uh, it's been good. Thanks. I was up pretty late last night. I went to a, a sort of all-day board game party. Um, nice. So I was there for like uh, eight or ten hours. Um, and I was actually doing some play testing of my own board game there. Oh. Um, so I didn't get home till like one uh, thirty a.m. Uh, is that is that a tease of, of, of something, or have you um, announced it already um, in the board game? I, I've sort of mentioned in passing, I guess, on, in some other places that I'm working on something. It's It's been pretty like unofficial, just working on it with a friend of mine back in Chicago, um, my co-designer. Uh, it's, it's still pretty early, but it's sort of a um, two-player co-op uh, space survival game um, that we're working on. And uh, I think we'll probably be ready to announce it pretty soon, at least as like a thing with a name. Um, but hope, it's probably still a ways away. Please call it a thing with a name, please. <laughs> a thing with a name. That sounds kind of sci-fi. It kind of yeah, does. Yeah. It you does. That's true. That's um, and then in in the Ueda realm, um, I played. What did I play? I played Colossuses five through eight. I want to say yes. uh, a couple nights ago. I'm sort of making my way slowly through the you know in the remake um, mm. or the rebuild, whatever they're calling it. Um, yeah, the remaster piece. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a good one yeah i do have i do have sort of uh mixed feelings about it but yeah. maybe we can chat some more about that later we but must, um but yeah so making my way through that and then that's it, obviously been a lot on my mind recently just with um you know just talking to people about it and um going on some other podcasts and stuff and this past monday i was on sony's um uh sort of like introductory live stream the evening of release where we hung out for a couple hours and just played through the game and chatted so um yeah fresh on my mind for sure for sure that's really great yeah and i've noticed um and Obviously, there's different recording times for things, but in terms of like the chronology of me seeing you going on, like for example, kind of funny, and then also the um, PlayStation blogcast with uh, Ryan and Sid um, mm -hmm. discussing the book. Um, I'm not sure, obviously, how or when those were recorded, whether there was not too long ago, but it did. It does seem that because obviously the uh, the, the remake coming out, that um, the book that you did put out in 2015, um, it's that's you know I showed you the Reddit post there. Like I'm basically saying, look, there's this like literally, it's the perfect thing to go through this in a sort of meditative uh, stage by stage <laughs> colossus by colossus um um fashion and 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 that it synced up with what we're doing like i had almost i have very um I think I was aware of, of uh, your association with um, Celeste, um, mm -hmm. but I, I had no knowledge. Um, uh, and also, of I think Boss Fight Books have done some um, uh, some books with uh, authors who have been on podcasts that I've heard, such as like you know Bonfire Side Chat. There's I believe there's a Dark Souls book um, done through a Boss Fight. 
Uh, not not on boss fight yet. Okay. Um, there okay. was a there was Dark Souls. There was a they did the book of Future Press that was more of a strategy guide. Oh, yeah. um, but I think there has been there's a Dark Souls a separate book that I think Keza McDonald worked on if I remember correctly, mm. but not butter boss fight specifically. Okay. Well, yeah, it was definitely you. You had been in the ether and now in focus, <laughs> Mr. Certner here. Um, did you have a look at the testament that I did did up for you? E, sorry, which what which what, the, oh, oh, like the, the testament the, um, the testament of amelioration. It's uh, something we put together for only a couple of guests through interactive artistry every year, just to really actually. I mean, again, we're not like some big institution. Obviously, we're still kind yeah, of yeah. starting out. No, thank but, you. I, I did look at it briefly yesterday uh, when you sent yeah. through on Twitter, uh, yeah. and it is very cool. I'm looking at it again now. I love just sort of the art in the background, and the, that wax <laughs> seal is pretty sweet. I dig it, man. Black, come on, black wax, because fuck you. Yeah, right? I know it's great. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, um, uh, I appreciate that. No, man, absolutely. I really, really um, want to um, just take that moment again uh, with 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 what with the sort of books that you do, and this is something I've talked with Ray as well, and 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 also um, Logan and and Sam, who's also on this show. He can't make it um, this um, week because he's um, celebrating his wife's birthday, and I was like, nice excuse, buddy. Honestly, I mean, we have Nick on the show. Actually, no, I didn't give him shit, but. Um, what I basically said is like with this medium, um, we are um, in a, in a, in a sense uh, we can't we can't shake the fact that in a in a, in a very predominant sense game the word game is still associated with time wasting and uh, strictly recreation or distraction or competition um, where we are really trying to and that's if you look up the actual definition of ameliorate it is to better something and we want to really just better that term so that game becomes more like the association doesn't immediately like oh I'm going to play a game that's the, I mean Nick when I say that I'm going to go play a game like doesn't that it just culturally initially like just on the surface basically connotate I'm going to go waste time or something or other right yeah, I mean, I think even, you know, when I talk to my parents about what I've been working on and doing for the past decade, like it's there's just something that is is lost, I think, especially for a generation who um, didn't grow up with it. And in my case, uh, parents who didn't grow up in the U.S., um, I was born in South Africa originally. Um, I guess you probably read that in the book. But um, so there's a lot of things that are, are lost and um it's just there's sort of a weird a weird generational gap generally, and I think that what they hear about games on you know on the news or in the general cultural consciousness just is is a fairly immature representation of where games are yeah. right now intellectually and emotionally. Um, and I think uh, you know in the mainstream AAA space too, uh, gaming does tend to have a bit of an arrested development and is still sort of um, you know needing to target the lowest common denominator in a lot of ways. Uh, so, you know, we're, we are getting there as a medium for sure, but I think the, you know, sort of the most visible games and the perception of games is catching up. So it I think is. you guys doing any work in that space to better things is is great for everybody. I appreciate that. Hey, man. Albert. Yeah, go um, ahead, Logan. Yeah, did, um, this this actually reminds me of something. Recently, I don't know if you saw this, was there not one of those uh, those inflammatory news reports about how these video games are, are poisoning our society in, uh, I think it was Adelaide? and. Oh yeah, I think I did read about that. Yeah, um, yeah, we have we have a very interesting relationship with games here in Australia. There's still it's interesting. You hear it in the, in in the news about just the government's like fundamental misunderstanding <laughs> of the medium, really. Um, but you're right. Like there's there's like um, it, it happens all the time. Uh, you, I, I'm I'm very surprised that you heard about it like all the way over over yonder. Like, uh, but um, do you have similar things that happen with yourself, Logan and and, and Nick? <laughs> I mean, I was just saying it because you know that was that was related to the um yeah the uh, topic of discussion, and it's so crazy that those kinds of things still happen. I know um, and it was totally misrepresented. Yeah, I saw it on the on YouTube here. Someone made a video about it. Uh, the games journalist Jim Sterling. Um, mm. Yeah, and I just was wondering if you had seen that because that was you know where you live, um, which is disturbing, <laughs> frankly. It, it is. Uh, <laughs> it is disturbing, and it's nothing. Um, I'm you know I have to kind of fess up and like yeah, I suppose I'm in the, the same country who who does have these kinds of attitudes, but uh, but uh, yeah, it's important to acknowledge that sort of thing. But yeah, it it only serves to to underline that we still have a ways to go, and um, with everything you do, uh, Mr. Sutton or Nick, like uh, it's 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 worthy, it's meritorious of just taking that space and dedicating a yeah, like just. Uh, well, I, I, uh, I call it a commemorative thing, but it's also like a testament. That's why I use the word testament. So, um, right. and uh, yeah, pretty. Well, like, I mean, like you said, it lined up really well, I think, chatting with you guys about what you're doing. And I think yeah. you, you know, the structure in which you approach the game, uh, covering it in the podcast anyway, is how I thought about it, obviously, in the in the book, too, of sort of breaking things down and diving in deep on each colossus and each element. So definitely yeah. excited to chat more with you guys about that stuff. 
it's really keen absolutely really yeah cool. and um, as i mentioned i think in like some of our correspondence um this is yeah like our first main sort of chapter by chapter we're going for it here the first couple of episodes had been essentially setting it up the very first one was um speculating on the girl and the sleeping giant which before we sort of dive into the forbidden lands and mono and wanda may i please have your just sort of hot take on the upcoming in development title from mr oweda yeah yeah i mean honestly I, I you know i saw the the image around new year's or whenever that was and uh it was interesting i i, I didn't think too much of it and haven't thought too much through i think mm -hmm. hearing you guys chat a bit about it was sort of the first like dive i've heard into it um you know obviously there's there's imagery reminiscent of mono um and sort of other like uh you know protagonists and art direction that he's had um so it made me think like well is this a development on some of the stuff he's done already is this something brand new that just has some thematic and visual similarities which i think i heard you guys talk about the fact that that might you know might be disappointing it might yeah. not i think we are ready for him for you know something different from him but yeah of course me. i'm incredibly excited <laughs> yeah. about it. yeah i think <laughs> well, logan was maybe a bit more suspect of it but um <laughs> uh which is which is healthy and I, and i agree and i think i would have you know if we saw sort of another game with a uh, you know, a muted color palette and um, soft lighting and everything. Like, I think I might be a little suspicious at first, but of course, I think it would, you know, end up being incredible. So I'm excited to see yeah. what what he does, and hopefully on a shorter timeline, of course, and a little more independently. I would hope so. Yeah. Um, I'm, you know, I'm intrigued for sure, but I, you know, I sort of wasn't reading too much into it yet. Um, yeah. But I'm curious to see where it goes, of course. Yeah, and that's a healthy attitude to have. Um, but we're we we're not going to be healthy here. We're, we're every every <laughs> every week we're, we're going to like look at every, each and every damn brick and here. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, and and I actually emphasize this is as much as we go in depth, we don't go like unappealingly, exhaustively, like obsessively conspiracy kind of theory in depth. Um, which because um, I'm not sure if you know, uh, Nick, we have Death Stranding podcast as well on our network. <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> so it's uh we have to always make sure we sort of rein it in because um again um uh, silence is um you know any can be anything and when there's like a big chunk of either uh, enigmaticness or um uh yeah something that can be variously interpretable um if you're not careful you can go too far into stringing one assumption onto another until you have this sort of ramshackle theory that as soon as a new thing is released it just fall, falls down <laughs> you know yeah, that's sure, yeah. you know that's kojima's specialty yeah, uh, way is. to the way to thankfully is is a little more uh yeah. what's there is there you yeah. know that's right yeah no, well it's it's interesting too because i think i mean you guys discussed nomad a little bit um and i, I talked about him in my book and i've been emailing on and off with him for a couple of years now and yeah. you know he obviously in some ways went sort of down that deep deep dive yeah. like conspiracy path um which was which was really interesting and i you know as i say in my book like i've never seen anything documented as thoroughly as i've seen him document shadow of the colossus which mm -hmm. was incredible to just like pour over his blog um, yeah, we hope to have him on the show actually yeah, no, that would that would be great. Um, I don't I don't know what it is about Australians and obsession with this game, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but um, yeah. So, but but it's interesting to sort of see some of his work and theories now pop back up with the the remaster piece uh, in your parlance. Um, <laughs> so you know, and and there's now seemingly a trophy named after him, and uh, some of the sort of hidden coin stuff in the game tied into some of his work, and so it's just interesting seeing that culture of the game sort of come back and influence yep. the last version of it i i, I absolutely um i totally agree with you man and logan did you have something for that one no no i just think it's really cool yeah, <laughs> you know no, yeah, I, did, I just got that trophy today um oh look really at you cool i i see. made time yeah. i'm logan i made time to play the game <laughs> i didn't have to edit a four-hour god of war podcast no no, no. yeah well you know, we, i appreciate it uh, yeah no. I'm, I'm 14 out of 16 right now i actually beat number 14 i think like five minutes before we started recording okay oh, very nice nice yeah I'm, I'm curious actually to see the like the final colossus and the ending because obviously mm -hmm. that hasn't really been in any of the media yet and i'm sure i could go youtube yeah. it but i want to see it for myself and mm -hmm. uh you know a lot of things look substantially different i'd say in the game in in some ways so i'm curious to see sort of how the whole ending looks uh you know, I guess I shouldn't spoil too much, but just to see how that all goes down in the new version. Yeah, I'm I'm very keen for that as well, definitely. Um, by, by the way, how spoiler sensitive generally are we here? Oh, Do you want this to be really pristine open. for people new to the show? I think we're we're pretty open, aren't we, Logan? Just go for it. I mean, it's yep. again the yeah, original. Yeah, yeah, you can say whatever. Yeah, say whatever. Totally easy. Totally okay. Easy. <laughs> cool. 
Awesome. Well, that was kind of, yeah, I wanted to get that hot take on the newer project. Um, and I just I have to ask, um, because, um, you know, out of nowhere, when I was reading your book, um, you know, it starts, as you say, we can't go into Shadow of the Colossus without talking about eco. And just mm -hmm. that chapter, just your, like, however many pages um, made me just immediately want to play eco as well. Like, it really, <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that I just, again, breaking down, starting as comprehensively, maybe it's sort of a collective appreciation for like OCD stage by stage, you know, chapter by chapter, take your time. Uh, kind of mentality that we all all of us share here um i really like that spoke to me so much man and i was like listening listening to this this chapter i was like um well i have to i have to ask him next time uh, you know when when i get the opportunity what would you think of an eco remaster coming from a blue point um yeah, that's a great question i mean i think it's uh to me it's actually i don't know if it's the more obvious game but it's sort of a, a more important game for it in some ways because I think, and I've, I've talked about this in other places, but I think Eco is, is a much more influential game overall and maybe sort of more important to gaming history as much as I, you know, love Shadow and that's my number one. Um, but uh, I think people having the opportunity to to play Eco, you know, easily would, would be great. And it's a game you can play, you know, in like two sittings. So it'd be great to see, uh, you know, of course, having that level of um remake like i said i do i do feel a little bit conflicted about it and i'm still working through those feelings and i'm trying to sort of reserve my full judgment until i get through the game but um it does seem like a great next natural step and i think especially if this one sells well uh i think that will be uh you know hopefully a great indicator that it's something they should they should do well what we hope actually um i'll just reveal this uh, what we hope is that as you've been saying you know keeping your judgment wondering you know uh, processing it we actually hope that you'll actually fully unleash on this episode so that it's on record that you hate <laughs> the remake that, that you <laughs> that you are resentful to the utmost <laughs> no, i'm kidding i'm kidding but needless to say yeah uh, yeah i'm in whatever publication kind of way or maybe in an interview at some point do you i think yeah you do have a blog don't you uh, mr sudo uh not that not that I ever used so i twitter is okay. my, my my most used outlet but yeah i mean definitely i'd love to come back in a, a future episode and we can maybe like chat in depth once we've all had a chance to play through it I'll have you um, take a moment to think about all the people that regularly Google in and go to your blog. They just look like children, like orphans outside in the snow <laughs> waiting for your next. Okay, how can you do this? How could you do this, Nick? Uh, <laughs> I should just delete it. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We're on the mystery. That's all good. That's all good. Well, um, off the bat, just so I don't forget, we um, jump into sort of Reddit here and there because they're kind of um, so, sort of where we arose from, really. Um, I, I think Reddit is a write-off um, uh, on the desktop. It's all about the app, frankly. Um, do you use it uh, by any chance, Nick? No, I feel like like Reddit, the fact that I've never been able to fully get into Reddit makes me feel very old. Um, That's fine. So I, 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 I don't really... A friend has tried a few times, but I haven't. I haven't sort of used it for more than a few minutes. I think you show me if you show me that on on the desktop, I'll immediately just crack your ha laptop in half. It, it it angers me how cluttered and awful it is compared to how smooth and like streamlined and and in entirely awesome and like humanity affirming the damn app is. I because see. you 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 go, you choose whatever kind of outlets. There's humanity being bros, uh, you know, animals being bros. You like you open it up. Sometimes it can it can turn my entire day around. How awesome this app is. So it's a great okay. Well, I'm downloading it right now. While I'm talking to you, so oh my man, my man. Yeah, it's uh, you know, it's um, it's a plate of great, it's a place of great good, and also it could be a place of great evil. Uh, <laughs> it can be, as, <laughs> as Logan has experienced with the uh, yeah, like yeah. you for loving or appreciating the remake, being like, hey, kill yourself, Logan. It's like, buddy, chill out. Yeah, okay, this isn't, <laughs> you know. It, and I and as I iterated on that episode, Nick, it's just like the furthest thing that that's about is Fumito or Logan. It's like, look at yourself, buddy. Like, <laughs> honestly, you know, for your own it's mental cool. health. Uh, it's surprising to. To, to see someone like that even you know with such a um i don't know kind of an angry personality even enjoying a way this game but you know maybe it's a testament to uh to how many people the way to can uh reach out to with with his titles so i suppose i suppose that's <laughs> right. a very kind way of putting it and uh we'll leave for the after show of just like actually venting about these people no, I'm kidding. Right, anyway <laughs> no, look we, we we're, we, exactly no we don't do that um but yeah we have um one comment for yourself uh, nick uh, among many um uh, praxada says cool i had no idea this book existed but it's now on my wish list i guess my question is what's the most surprising thing that he discovered as a new uh, about shadow edit have you thought about sharing this on game facts their board of the remake is a bit more active than this one so anyway i'll leave that to later but yeah he asks um so what was the most surprising thing you discovered about a shadow of the colossus in your on your deep dive Oh man, um, that's a great question that I probably don't have like a default answer to. Um, 
I think just some of the like uh, I, I'd never really gone down the fan the the rabbit hole of fan theories that that Nomad and some others sort of led the charge on, um, and I found it really interesting. And I think even things like the previous Wanderers theory, which talks about uh, sort of different places in the game where it seems like um, you know Wanderers have been there before, um, and there's sort of little leftovers of campfires and other things. And this isn't the first time this has happened. And I think I find that sort of like cyclical nature in a lot of media really interesting. And there's other books and things that I really have enjoyed that in. And I think that's definitely a theme, a potential theme of Oeda's games. So um, seeing a theory like that just sort of makes me re- reevaluate things a little bit um, and just, you know, have a different sort of open mind when I play the game. So mm-hmm. that stuff was really cool that I just didn't have any awareness of before really diving in on the book. Mm-hmm. OK, yeah. Well, I, I think one of the things that I sort of took away from like the very beginning of the book, as, you, as you're sort of setting the stage in the early chapters, um, uh, is just describing the environment. Right. Um, and like. Even though, you know, as you say, like this, it's really hard to sort of pin down, as you said, that you don't have a sort of a default answer for it. But um, I, I kind of have to sort of tap into what maybe Logan probably is either thinking 24-7 or whatever kind of led him to kind <laughs> of do his blog and everything is that um, it's less so much. There's nothing like, oh, look, I found like a, a rock. And if you look underneath it, there's Fumito at his face. Like like he doesn't do, um, you know, Kojima style like surprises or anything like that. More of it, uh, more so it's, it's uh, I find that it's the, the, the amount of time spent actually sitting with the material that can lead to surprising revelations you know about um and that's what i feel as though the best of art can do or what like art's sort of purpose really is to kind of reshape worldviews and um, sort of shake kind of our cores and into sort of becoming more open-minded and um yeah like mindful people um and like that's something that like is very much wrapped up in in your approach um definitely uh, nick yeah, I think that sort of like uh, just time spent, and in this case, uh, you know, like what what are we at? Thirteen years. Like mm-hmm. people have time have had time to marinate on all these things and really, um, you know, dive deep on them. And regardless of Ueda saying like there's no more secrets to find, it hasn't stopped you know anybody. And that's that's part of what's sort of uh, unique and exciting about the game is like he's never he's never given all the answers, which is very rare. And so that's why people are still looking. And that's why the game has this culture of mystery uh, that it still has. And I think that's really important. And that's why it's uh, sort of withstood this t- sense of time in a lot of ways and or the, the you know, test of time. Um, and I, I guess in some ways, too, that's that's uh, part of some people's feelings about the remake, too. And it's not just mine. Um, you know, I was being a little like cheeky about it. And I do, have, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm still working through it. But there's a great article I, re- I was read on Eurogamer um, called "The Question of Fidelity in Shadow of the Colossus," and just talking about how um, a lot of the sort of the game originally was just sort of the suggestion of an environment and a lot of sort of suggestive imagery because it didn't have the resolution, you know, back on PS2 to really render these things perfectly. And you know, so there's a lot of space to sort of fill where your mind could just fill things in and have more of a theater of the mind experience. Whereas now mm. with the remake, everything is like you know, sort of photo real and um, doesn't leave as much room for interpretation, uh, which, you know, it, it is beautiful, but something is lost there, certainly. And I think if people are playing it for the first time, of course, they're not going to know what is lost. But I think there is something um, that, you know, when you, and, and honestly, I've been thinking about this a lot, too, and I have not I haven't said this out loud to anyone yet, so maybe it'll come off as gibberish. But I think actually, in a way, even um, the fact that like photo mode is in the game as as cool as that is. I think that feature alone is like really antithetical to yeah. Ueda's mm-hmm. games where, uh, you know, it, they're so authorial and so careful <clears throat> and so nuanced. And when you put a lot of that uh, sort of those tools in the user's hands, um, it's cool in other ways, of course. But again, something fundamental, you know, is lost about the experience. I think, um, you know, the difference between, for example, exhibitionism and uh, like be- between uh, exhibition and expedition, like for me, it's like, when you're immersed and you're literally on an expedition into this title, into these stories, and this is something that I regularly clash with as a kind of a quasi Luddite with um, like PlayStation Network notifications popping up, the share button, all this such thing. And I don't, again, I don't want a uh, hundred, maybe if we even have a hundred listeners, I hope we do. Um, but a hundred uh, millennials, maybe, I don't know, or like, technology leaning people just rolled their eyes when i said that because it's like oh you can turn it off in the notifications and you can ignore the photo mode and look at you taking your stance on like oh what real blah and it's like i that's a totally everything like that's all valid different viewpoints like that are valid for sure but um i it it's it it takes away like for example last guardian that didn't have a photo mode right 
No, right, no. that's true. Exactly. And and you're right. That authorial aspect, that deliberate, you know, stage by stage being immersed. Like I wouldn't, if I was reading, for example, like to, you know, who knows down the line, like my daughter or son reading a book, I wouldn't jump out and be like, what are you thinking of this? Oh, about this angle. <laughs> oh, da, da, da. It's like, no, you're in the story. Um, and you don't have this sense of like, wouldn't it be great if I paused the game right now? And how beautiful is this to the, to the, like, you should just have it be, it's, <laughs> I think, I suppose it's an extension of um, the idea of not being present at like a concert, for example or if at like a music event you know you mentioned having watched yachts recently right mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Uh, that band um how many people had their phone out for example right <laughs> it's right yeah yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it just changes the way you're engaging with that thing fundamentally and you know i'm i'm guilty of it too i mean you know when i was fighting gaius the, you know third colossus in this remake of course um you know i like when i was up on his head that's one of my you know sort of that's what been some of my most favorite imagery from the game for these 13 years. And I love that moment. Mm-hmm. And so of course I popped out the photo mode and I turned the night mode on and I swung the camera around. Um, and it was super cool, but it, it just was a different experience. It wasn't, yeah. it wasn't quite this, you know, this weird sentient thing living in this video game who I'm intruding on, you know, suddenly it was sort of just like this toy box for me to yeah. experience. Yeah. Um, and more of like an homage to what the original experience was, mm-hmm. which, Again, is not none of this stuff is like inherently a bad thing, but it does it does change it, um, mm-hmm. and I think it changes it more than um, people realize when they sort of hear that Shadow of the Colossus has a remake. Like to me, it to, you know to me thinking about it more as an homage like makes more sense because calling it a remake the remake is not I don't know it doesn't feel quite right. There have been times when when I've used the photo mode in cutscenes. And I've like felt a little bad after that, like when a Colossus <laughs> is, is dying, especially yeah. I've I've t- I've done photo mode like several times, either while the Colossus is falling or just after when the tendrils are coming out. And right. I've always like felt kind of bad about it after. So I, I do you that was a great way of putting it where you said like being able to freeze that thing um, changes how it feels. That was a really great way of putting it. So, yeah, I, I totally do understand that. Something yeah. I, I did want to ask you. Nick, um, was you probably have, have actually talked to Ueda and you've been at Gen Design um, mm-hmm. and you've written multiple books on these games. Would you feel like you have a little more insight into to this universe than other people? Or do you still feel kind of just as baffled as everyone else at some of these questions everyone has about the Master of the Valley or, or pretty much any aspect of it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um... I guess I may be, on a, a practical sense, I may be no more than than most people, only from sort of being in the belly of the beast, in a sense. Um, especially, you know, when we were working on the Last Guardian book and then, you know, being in gen design and talking about these things and without being too much of a tease, like not everything made it in the book. Like there were certainly mm-hmm. things where we sort of over-discussed and then we, we had to pull things back a little bit. And so I, I think sort of logistically, I know maybe a little more than the average person, but that said, uh, still there there are reams of mysteries and the big the big mystery. Like I don't know the big answers, you know, the important mm-hmm. stuff. Um, right. But honestly, I, I don't know. And it's you know it's tough because I think a lot of this is lost in translation too in, in chatting with the team casually. But I, I I don't know that that all of the team does necessarily either. I think a lot of it really does like you know exist in in Oeda's head, and that's part of the magic of it. And you know he shares what is important to share and keeps some stuff to himself. And I think there's I think he's the only one who has a lot of these answers, literally. Um, so uh, you know there's sort of this extension of like the team knows it more than he does, and then Sony knows a, or like the team knows a bit less than he does. Sony probably knows a bit less than that. You know I know a bit less than that then yeah. you guys know a bit less and then you know but uh, no one really has all the answers so yeah. um i think again that's part of the mystery of the you know of the game and the culture of the game and that's why it's fun to, to chat about the other one thing sort of that was touched on earlier was about like Ueda's relationship with his own work um and this is something that again i kind of wanted to throw to logan because he's spoken to me about um how that he's found that that like kind of like fascinating um that his approach is always a little bit his his, his sort of yeah attitude to his own work is always v- very different to what he, um, the wider world um, kind of thinks. So did you have anything to speak to that, Logan, with like Nick here? Um, no, I mean, I've, I've said what I said about it. it. It's it's just very interesting how humble he is yeah. and just how he, um, you know, he, he just never goes too in-depth on almost anything um, just concerning his own work. Um, and yeah, it's just always very interesting to, to hear him talk about his games uh, because like it, it, he'll talk about them like they're 
uh, video games the same as any other, the same as Dying Light, which is a game that I know he liked uh, from a couple years ago. Yeah. Um, and obviously to us, they're, they're very different from that. So yeah, that's just a, something very interesting about him. And then maybe other Japanese creators might share that uh, aspect. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah I, I think part of that too, it just comes from from Japanese culture as well about being mm-hmm. incredibly humble. And I think That's spending right. you know a little bit of time there over a few trips, I think that is something that um, yeah, it just goes part and parcel with with the culture beyond just professionally, but in general. Um, and so I think their you know Japanese creators' relationship to their work is probably different. I think than the than the Western world and sort of. Um, you know, being sort of more uh, overt authors uh, or authors of the of the stuff, and being sort of a very you know a vocal singular voice like a like a Ken Levine or someone who you know is is certainly as humble as he needs to be, but clearly he's the visionary behind his works, and so and that's I mean, part of the culture of it. Whereas I think Ueda is like the reluctant visionary in a sense where you know he knows he is, but it's not in his it's not in his nature or his or his his you know the way he's grown up to really sort of lean into that. True. That's right. Um, yeah, I think the main thing that when I um, when I sort of see Ueda and talking about his work and stuff, it almost feels like he's a, he's a developer for another series of games in, in a way because he, he talks about them in different terms. Um, I just I came off of like um, art school and stuff. I particularly have a chip on my shoulder about when um, I wanted to share this with you, Nick. When um, people just sit, like for example, in front of like a toilet seat above, you know, just like maybe suspended with like lights around it, and just say, oh, and they just clap and they say, oh, look at the layers. Wonder what the artist was in t- intending. With like the way that the toilet seat is flapping and oh the the, the meaning the significance and and I, I have a particular chip on my shoulder for people who who literally can't distinguish like this is shit this was a fuck up and stop trying to like read into it and give it all these layers um and and so one of the things that like for example last guardian gets is the idea and also actually all of them they all the janky controls quote quote unquote um Earlier in your book, you earlier in, in in your book you discuss how like he actually deliberately it was a conscious thing to want to get non-video game people on these to be to be able to convey a non-video game in, in essence experience without heads-up displays or any of those sort of trappings and tropes. Um, right. And yeah, that's right. And so and what I kind of found with Last Guardian is that every all of these were intentional. Like it, it all. I, I, I'm, and then again, maybe even like intentional or not, like they left it in because it serves it serves the narrative. Like a, a child is a bit like kind of like as you write, write earlier in your book they're sort of slippery and, and they like kind of just they're they're gangly in the way that they move and the same with the boy from last guardian and then the biggest mm-hmm. one for me because as i mentioned um logan talked about how like he's a shadow guy he came in at shadow um i i would take it that because you experienced eco you sort of that was the first experience sort of you had uh, nick with with his yeah, first game yeah, that's right. yeah. Um, yeah. and for me i'm a last guardian guy um that game in in, and I really I stand to gain nothing from blowing things out of proportion is it's a game that kind of essentially saved my life because it was um, mm-hmm. I had a pretty awful um, military accident lots of um, I was left out on a firing range actually it was pretty hectic uh, in in uh, 2007 and then leading into um, like in that whole recovery period it was basically you know how they have like comfort animals that they give like people who have suffered right, right. PTSD Trico was my comfort animal you know um that i I dove straight into it i connected immediately with this reassuring huge kind of boy and his beast kind of presence like ready to sweep me off into another place there where there wasn't that kind of level of pain or whatever or confusion or doubt or anything um and i connected immediately with like the struggle of trying to put this beast on ps3 you know um and and when i when i um sort of followed the development over the however many years i just saw like fumito became the boy and the beast became the beast of the game of the development and trying to con- get that thing to go where you want it to go like that's what Fumito was doing I was wondering if you saw that de- the development of Last Guardian in that same kind of metaphorical way um, compared to the gameplay and such um I guess not I, I didn't see it as, as his journey as much per se but maybe just the journey of the game and and sort of you know its history moving platforms and everything that it went through um you know, and I think that, that the team probably does have sort of some some trauma from that in some sense, and I'm sure he does as well. But, uh, you know, I think just making it out on the other end, uh, you know, intact, as I'm sure, you know, you experience a little bit um, in the, you know, situation you're talking about, like, yeah. 
sort of that's the important takeaway and the fact that they were able to make it to that point um, and now sort of have their have this thing. And I'm sure it does feel like a weight lifted in some ways. And I think that's why it's also especially interesting thinking about, you know, what what's next for them and going into that without any baggage at all, uh, I imagine. So um, and I think, you know, honestly, when I was there for Last Guardian, um, it was still a little bit, you know, a little bit raw for them. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the first it was I was there for two days and the first day uh, I played through the whole game um, with the whole team there, except for Ueda. Or I, I didn't play the team played it in front of us and we sort of chatted. And then the second day um, we sort of finished it up and then Ueda came by um, and we had a long interview and chatted and stuff. But I think, you know, for him, it's like he didn't really want to be around for the playthrough because it's sort of, mm-hmm. you know, he's been living in the space for so long and so far, uh, you know, in it that it's, it's I think was probably probably hard for him at the time being so fresh of like, let's, you know, re-examine the whole thing from the start. So, yeah, yeah, there was um, a recent interview with uh, Famitsu that a way to, it was a discussion that a way to took part in with uh, Hideki Kamiya and yeah. uh, Masahiro Sakurai, where he actually says uh, that he doesn't really like to watch people play the games. Um, I think partially because uh, development can, can often be so hard. So you're, you're definitely absolutely right on that. It's really interesting to know that you experienced that firsthand. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, for sure. And yeah, I'm not surprised at all. I think especially after something of that, you know, of that length and and everything. And I can, you know, seeing uh, in the indie game space, which is where I tend to sort of operate professionally and personally, um, seeing games like the Iconoclasts and Gorgo that have been uh, in development for seven to ten years uh, by a single person. And yeah, and having those games come out, like I'm, I'm sure it's. I can't imagine how it is for for those folks too. That seems even more intense when you've just sort of been down in this world by yourself for a decade. Um, mm. So uh, yeah, I mean, it's you know uh, that is to say, Ued is obviously not the only person going through that, but I think his games tend to have the most visible, uh, you know, the most visibility while it's happening and the most public baggage. So I think the fact that Last Guardian came out and is as good as it is in a lot of ways, um, and and had the impact that it had for a lot of people is is honestly incredible um given the histories uh i think we're all lucky to have that we are yeah absolutely and again it's just that testament um i I kind of put really last guardian as like the heart of interactive artistry really because there is a there was a question and there's no way that a development that long um uh can you know go like the process of that there's no way that throughout that you wouldn't have start to have questions of like is this worth it could could i can this actually be done um you know it's been this long um you know should should it be shelved all this thing um i kind of connected that with like you know um you know this here's the thing like journey had risen up that game company is is killing it with like sky and uh, abzu is you know there's this rise and obviously these games that since eco and since you know shadow of the colossus that there's been this uh, culture of call it art game whatever you want but again this um this particular genre of, of titles and just the expansion of what um games can do emotionally psychologically symbolically philosophically um and i can i'm sure that like in the middle of that it's like 10 years well um it, i mean like it seems as though things are really taking off on their own does this really need to exist and um that is what i connected with interactive artistry is does this need to exist sure like you'll have people on comments uh, on and in interviews they'll throw it to they'll throw it to games and uh, in terms of how they're sort of the artistic growth and the medium maturing but we don't really need a dedicated outlet for it we don't need a that's what what is that like you know and um wondering about whether or not that needed to or was worthy of existing and at one point like when i saw um it was it was sort of it sort of carried me through that way so um in 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 relation to shadow because i know you've written this book did it have any kind of um without obviously going into anything you didn't want to share nick but um was there anything of a personal connection uh to the titles that um that maybe you haven't covered in your books that maybe that they uh with spending this length of time with the material and the subject matter of like sacrifice and anything that resonated there um, maybe not thematically in that sense, but I think that, you know, the game has informed sort of my aesthetic so much and what I appreciate in art and a lot of sort of the, the mystery I appreciate in life. And, uh, weirdly even having a taste for things like escape rooms, I think in a yeah. lot of ways is tied back to, to shadow for me. Um, even though it feels pretty disconnected, uh, That's but, awesome. um, and then I think for me, writing the book on an existential level felt really important because I'm someone who does sort of live in a state of existential crises in, yeah, in uh, you know, a lot of the time. Um, it, it just in like, you know, sort of the what is my what is my impact on Earth? What am I leaving behind? What am I really doing? Like all that, you know, that typical stuff. Um, oh, you, you and me are brothers. So I think, what the hell? That's literally my yeah. life at all times, constantly. <laughs> Go for it, buddy. So, uh, I think, you know, I think just having the opportunity to write the book and and get that out there like at least i can say this is my 
mm. a, you know, sort of, I mean, it's, you know, whatever, even reading it two years later, it's like, I'm sure there's, there's always some things that would change, but looking back, it's like, I got to write pretty much the book I wanted to and talk about a thing that I love, like, you know, write my love letter ultimately to a thing that has been really, you know, important and a big presence in my life. So that to me was important. And it doesn't really parallel any of the, you know, necessarily the game thematically, but that's sort of the personal impact it had for me, um, was, was being able to get that out there. And, and the last Guardian book, honestly, was just sort of icing on the cake. That was really fun. And, yeah. you know, I got to go meet with the team for that. And that was just a great, a great time. And it was fun sort of being able to to go into that, um, uh, you know, having been the guy who wrote the other book. And uh, honestly, one sort of funny story, which I don't think I've told anywhere, but um, is, uh, you know, I interviewed Uwe a couple of times over email way back when I was in the press, like, you know, eight, 10 years ago. And then for my Shadow of the Colossus book, um, so I think he had some sense of, of who I was, but he didn't realize that I was the one writing the last guardian book. So when I showed up there and like met him for the first time and was introduced to him, uh, he was like, Oh, Nick Sutner. Like he was like really sort of happy and pleased that I was the one there <laughs> in the last guardian book. Um, yeah. so, uh, that was really like a nice heartwarming moment. Cause he, I was pretty nervous to meet him. Like, you know, having worked in games for, for a decade, like I've met, you know, sort of a lot of the, the big you know, long time creators and people who worked on things I grew up playing. And at this point, it's sort of I, I don't really get nervous and or, or you know, excited in that sort of like fanboy way. But for, you know, obviously meeting him at a different sort of baggage as this very elusive figure. Yeah. Um, but when I did, it was like he was immediately cool and chill and we had a great chat. Um, but it was really nice that he had some context for who I was already going into it. So, again, that that made it sort of all the nicer that I got to, like, get this this document out there. Yeah, seems like a really grounded kind of vibey kind of guy, you know. Um, nothing yeah. again that would. I mean, sometimes Kojima, I know that he leads and in, leans into his sort of rock star kind of status thing, but um, but Fumito, I get the. That's it's funny. I, I use the analogy of why I why I titled it Fumito Ueda podcast is like it's not so much as like an idolatry or kind of like boosting the guy himself sort of thing. It's more like if it's as though he was my friend at a party and he's just like super introverted and humble, and I just nudge him in the side. It's like, hey, this is, this is you, okay? <laughs> right. This is you, and <laughs> right, right. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, and that one point of you and then the other one is um because he's changed studios a couple times i don't want to have to change the name of the podcast again so he won't change his name yeah. so yeah <laughs> that <know>. works <laughs> that's right for sure well um logan unless you had any other kind of extra ditties to throw to nick before we dive into yeah uh, mono wonder and the forbidden lands um i'm happy to crack on was there anything else no let's do it let's do it fantastic
so let's crack on again. Um, listeners, uh, in my messages to Nick, I kind of, we sort of wanted to get him on this particular episode. It was an option to do next week's, but because we want to kind of, as, as again, maintain sort of our um, structure and everything is um, the idea that, uh, yeah, so he's kind of sending us off really in that kind of Gandalf kind of way. And the beard just totally makes it work as well because <laughs> uh, he's sort of handing us this literal, actual dedicated tome, which is super magical how that literally materialized. We were setting up to do this, Nick. You have no idea how surreal this is to come across your book and be handed this and i have it on my ebook reader now <laughs> and to be because we're going to read the um you know the beautiful kind of poetry for each of the colossi at the start of each colossi episode there's going to oh, be cool. music in, in the background we're going to ruminate on the meanings you know um even though they're the fan names we're going to speculate on like quadratus and barba and we're going to talk about that as well um so we couldn't have really honestly couldn't have hoped for a, a better person to have done this book. Uh, grateful for who you are, that you exist. Thank you, my man. Nick. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm glad it worked out. My pleasure. Fantastic. So um, I think I might, if that's Nick, right. um, did, did you make those fan names? Can I... <laughs> yeah, I think <laughs> you did. Was that secret for you? <laughs> no, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. <laughs> that was just the ether <laughs> look, look, look of, of the internet. Yeah. Oh, Nick, do you yeah. remember the ARG? You remember those podcasts, right, that came out with like the, 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 the viral marketing for Shadow back in 2005? Not really, actually. I did a little, little bit of reading on it, but I don't, I don't, I didn't experience it at the time. Yeah, with these like tiny little like one one forty four p videos of like person going to Antarctica and discovering like Barba buried under the snow. We're gonna have a right, episode right, right. dedicated to that. It's gonna be crazy. But oh, um, cool. um, you know what? We'll, we'll we'll circle around. So uh, I'll throw it to Logan just to kind of even out the sound waves. Logan, um, when you first played Shadow of the Colossus, entered the world. We are along the ridge. We're on Agro. We see the eagle. We're entering the Forbidden Lands. What brought Wanda here? Who is Mono? Just have your spiel. We'll go around in a circle, comment on each other's kind of ditties, and we'll go from there. Go for it, Logan. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I mean, it, you know, like I've said, I, I tend to um, not stray too far from what I can actually visually see. Yep. Um, so there's like, I don't have head cannons that I'm like, oh, this has got to be it. You know, for me, like, Wanda is, is a young man. Uh, who is probably not too experienced um, in combat or, or anything of that sort. Hmm. Um, and he stole the sword, um, and he stole Mono. Uh, and they, were probably, they probably sacrificed her. They were probably going to bury her. He probably took her from whatever, wherever they had her body. Yeah. Uh, and he, and he you know, stole off into the night. Um, and that's, uh, you know, basically enough for me almost. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, I, I think Mono um, probably was someone of some high sort of standing. You know, she's dressed in white. She looks very clean. Mm. Uh, and she was probably, you know, could have been some sort of priestess of some kind who sort of they they maybe knew they were going to sacrifice, you know, mm. for a long time. Um, I love and the you idea know, of her being uh, like a holy kind of uh, holy figure in in some community that like maybe again because of some sort of eco style infringement of like convention of like oh you know we can't have you here again that that connection with um with with eco there and um and mm-hmm. yeah exiling you know, like Yorda sort of thing but yeah go ahead man yeah and and you know I I um I wonder if you know uh, we don't know so much about the sacrifice is so interesting to me we 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 don't know. You know, uh, we we know almost nothing about it. I wonder, you know, maybe she was had come to terms with that. Maybe mm-hmm. she was okay with it. Uh, and obviously, Wander was not. Um, you know, maybe she believed in in whatever Lord Iman and, and the others believed. Um, that's that's a kind of a really interesting question, I think, about the games. But it's it's one that I'm okay with not knowing the answer to. Yeah. Um, and you know, I I would love to to see you know if the the, the movie project does happen. Um, I've said, I think, on past episodes that I wouldn't necessarily mind to see them elaborate on this because this is not a video game. This is a movie. Yeah, if you, separate, separate thing. My, yeah, my, my line on, on that basically is that if you want the version of Shadow of Colossus that is as mysterious as it can possibly be, we have that version. It's the, it's the video game. Yeah. Um, this can be a different version that does have a couple of flashbacks in it. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, you know, hopefully they don't mess with those too much. Um, but hear me, Musketi, uh, you and your, you game, and your ego with like succeeding at it. Now he's got his head is all inflated. Oh, it did so well. If he does jump back into yeah. it after doing Stephen King, is like, oh, don't you mess with it. I'm, I'm watching you. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. He he strayed very close to the book for it. So I, I kind of doubt that uh, Andy Muschietti will, will come back to the the Shadow of the Classes project. But okay. if he does, I think he would probably do it pretty well. Mm, okay. Cool. Um, Nick, did you have any sort of riffs off what uh, Logan just sort of um, raised? Yeah. 
Yeah, I think it's interesting thinking about um, their relationship, too, between Wanda and Mono. And it was something, actually, that I noticed on the, the back of the box art. I have the box. I'm holding the box now from the, the remake. Um, they actually have a line that says, Explore forbidden lands on a quest to bring your love back to life, yeah. which I think is probably just some, like, you know, lazy, like, marketing yeah, text. Yeah. I don't think it really <laughs> implies anything about it. But I think, uh, you know, it, in, a, in a way, it's sort of a funny... Um, you know, when I talk about sort of taking some of the mystery out of it, that's sort of a funny way to do it because I think their relationship really wasn't clear uh, before. And I think that's always been a point of interest for me. It's like, maybe it's your sister, maybe it's a girl you love, who knows? Or your mother, um, and I think also, I go into. or your mother, sure. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, um, which I guess she sort of becomes, uh, at, at the end in a way. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, and yeah, thinking about her state as well, like, is she dead or, or is she just in some sort of unconscious coma or some state? Like, there's all these basic questions about it, of course. Um, and then you mentioned sort of like the, you know, the maybe like royal appearance. And I think that that ties it back to some fan theories about her connection uh, to the queen and Eco. And, mm-hmm. you know, maybe she's the start of the, or maybe, you know, she will become the queen. Or maybe she's the start yeah, of this land I... of poor children and all these <laughs> other things. So, Yeah, for the record, um, I, and I've said this in the podcast before, I tend to really dislike the mono is the queen theories. So that's, that, that was not what I was going for. But um. <laughs> <laughs> but obviously if you were a proponent of those theories you know that's that is what it is you know that's the the wonderful nature of these games that you can think yeah. of whatever you want i actually pushed right. uh, logan in one of the earlier episodes to i said no no give us something give us a nugget man we were analyzing um the girl and the sleeping giant to the nth and um and i was like come on man like just give me something that i can like end the episode on and he's like okay fine i think the girl <laughs> on the plinth in that teaser shot that yeah, yeah. She, she's the queen from Eka. i was like yeah <laughs> <laughs> which i was not 100 percent serious i know about. I, I know I was um, kidding. Yeah, <laughs> but that's it. Uh, but yeah, uh, please continue, Nick. Oh no, sorry. That was yeah. That was that was my main riff okay. off of it. It's just it's interesting thinking about their you know uh, their relationship and their roles and mm. um, and then just thinking about yeah his role versus uh, or I, I, maybe it's more the the cursed nature I guess of of Mono and also of the boy uh, you know in in Eco and that parallel and obviously these are themes they keep coming up in his games. Yeah. That's right. Um, just to sort of circle it to me, I'll throw it back to Logan after this. Is um, I, I see obviously the universal interpretability really is how things endure. Um, you know, Logan has this blog, uh, this blog called um, uh, "The Lands of Light and Dark." And um, on one of our earlier episodes, we discussed what endures, what is the ingredients to something that endures. And to an extent, it is a degree of ambiguity. There's a degree of sort of elementality, things that are um, just things that kind of that are constants across years, across cultures. Um, the, right. the child or oh, sorry, the um, uh, the, uh, the 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 boy and the girl is a constant. That's a classic. That's an archetype. Um, uh, and the saving of one of the other is also an archetype. Um, and we also know that both in um, his uh, presentation, as in like we see again, he's got this sort of sad face, but he's got this heroic vibe with his cape and his sword. But there's this sullenness. There's this juxtaposition between the light and dark always, and light and dark always come up. And that's why I said Logan really couldn't have thought of a better title for for the blog there <laughs> for that one. Yeah, um, yeah, because um, everything in this game is tinged with both uh, very much. And um, in, in this beautiful altruistic act of wanting to bring back a loved one, he is messing with that which shouldn't be tampered with, which is nature, which is uh, the law of the laws of life and death and, and light and dark, really. Um, and the, the demon kind of, you know, of Dorman, really, which, by the way, phonetically demon Dorman. Um, Dorman also, you know, has uh, dormiente, which is uh, Latin and, and Italian for sleep, you know, again. Yeah, existing in that realm between death and life, which is sleep. You know, which is what um, the the uh, there's yeah. the Nimrod uh, connection as well, where it's an anagram for Nimrod, who is the Tower of Babel. He built the Tower of Babel in the Bible. Yeah. There you go. So um, all of these layers there. Um, so for me, it was very much like that's the first layer that I appreciate this on. Uh, and that is also going to be why both your book and, and this game in many years will be uh, touched on and um, like uh, referenced to. And um, because, again, it's it's that sort of seminal exploration, really, unless you decide when you're like 60 or 70 to be like, ah, going to chuck a Christopher Lee and dive back in and add 30, <laughs> 30 more chapters. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> who knows? But um, but that's that's kind of yeah that that sort of main take there on, on the surface. And then when it really came to um, 
I think I may have surprised Logan when I mentioned like about this theory of the mother. And and the reason I say this is because um, it kind of ties into, you know, how you mentioned, you know, at the end of the intro, like the roar of the earth kind of thing um, and, and the earth being associated with with motherhood. Um, and um, I again, I really it's I must I have to impress it on both of you. I, I hate diving down things where there aren't clues and that you're just coming up with shit <laughs> to fill space for me. That's just that's, that's fine. Cool. You just got you got out of art school. So that's what yeah. I'm no. <laughs> yeah, I like it. It's like a waste of art to do that for me. But what I what I do right. see there, and and then there's obviously the the question of like when people read into things is like what does it say about them? Just for the record, mum and I are cool. She's cool. I, I think she should make better choices in her life, <laughs> but we're cool. Um, but here's, here's here's my take on it is that um, she looks deathly pale. She's like uh, like almost the color of like like marble sort of thing. Um, definitely, yeah, in some kind of stasis. And my thinking was. Um, when he came to this land, like the feeling of this land being so ensconced, so hidden away, so forbidden, so to speak, would imply apocrypha. It would imply that this land is probably only ever really written about in like sort of, again, I use the Gandalf analogy uh, of like, you know, how he has that um, montage of him going to uh, Minas Tirith, diving deep into the archives. Mm -hmm. Who knows how long he was there trying to find the answers to the ring kind of thing, but the same kind of forbidden knowledge. Um, because just again, with like Voldemort and Horcruxes, he, he buried these secrets to life deep down. He buried these like that. And the, that, that, that sort of gave that implication um, for me. So storybook on that level of like a childhood fable, fairy tale, the girl and the boy. Fa fantastic. I'm happy to run with that. But if we did want to just have a little fun sort of exploring what could have led to it, I, I think um, he's been searching for this for years, like for many, many years, um, possibly even that he um, may wonder may have been something like 10 or 11 years old when like mono died and like something to do with some kind of like, uh, you know, um, strange magic that he wasn't able to comprehend, like why like maybe with a village or something again this gets pretty vague when you go there but needless to say she isn't aging like she's dead and she's in stasis and there's some kind of curse so possibly a demon cursed her to a a life where she was not able to pass on hence the gold the the white color of, of ghostliness um that that there's that connotation there so my thinking was that he's been he's sort of um taken this path of like pursuing all this sort of apocryphal knowledge to actually eventually find whatever kind of parchment that says turn here go over here like indiana jones style go to this mountain when the sun rises at this angle and then enter this valley and then like um, you know have you seen um nick you've seen um the mummy with brendan fraser sure yeah <laughs> <laughs> sorry to throw that kind of random but hamanaptra you know <laughs> how uh like yeah, yeah. it only reveals itself at, at a certain angle of the light on a certain day kind of thing for me the forbidden lands feel like a, a place out of place it feels like a like a, a sub dimension you know uh, of another world um and i weirdly get kind of you know um like david lynch like how he he, he leaves these big swaths of silence especially in the latest season of twin, of, of twin peaks mm -hmm. um where there's that and he's described like um you know he's he's you've got that transcendental meditation thing i've i've always derived from this like light dark a, a silent realm a cell you could almost use shadow of the Colossus as like a guide for meditation in so many ways <laughs> i really feel like you could you know like what are you here to accomplish what are you here um to confront and, and to change about your nature and and what do you want to examine about yourself so um but that's kind of my and i want to throw it obviously to logan to see if but did, any, did that raise anything for you at all about um what could potentially maybe form something beforehand again not going or oh, just to be lore lore filling and anything like that but just anything that was raised for you with that at all on logan um i mean the 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 thing about the forbidden lands that you know is is special to me and i don't remember the exact lines where this is said is that i think it's supposed to kind of be a land where time is stopped isn't that yeah. right yeah yeah that's right yeah um and that's really interesting you know you that more than anything makes me wonder like what happened there um no animals uh and you know with dorman yeah yeah i mean you know it's everything is is you know very just just kind of um Quiet. you know in stasis so like you said mono was um and that aspect is really interesting to me i i can't think of of what would have happened with dorman um i don't really care to i don't know about you know, if he was a worship and then his people turned on him, he turned on his people. That doesn't really matter to me. But but I mean, that aspect of time having stopped and then at the end of the game, possibly having resumed again. It, it's kind of hard to say. Oh, yeah. Um, it's like I, I the most like interesting the, thing. I think when they show like the hawk flowing through the, you know, the or flying through the skies, I think you sort of see that like it's raining and seasons have returned in a sense mm -hmm. and time is flowing. And then. Of course, when they go up to the secret garden, then they're with like a deer, you know, a deer comes out and a chipmunk. And I think like 
you know, this stuff sort of does kick in back to life um, as, as you're reborn as well. Um, anyway, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt. No, no, yeah, that's 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 totally true. Yeah, that's all I had to say because I, I mean I can't even think to speculate on any of that. <laughs> well, but, um, yeah, go ahead, Nick. Oh no, well, I was going to say I guess a couple other things too. Um, is I, I I well one is is events of last guardian of course and sort of Dorman's uh, you know sort of implied presence there maybe and how that ties into things too and whether that's a a sequel or a prequel but it seems like he sort of has a presence there as well that they're sort of you know they're keeping him maybe alive or keeping him trapped or whatever it is and you're uh, yeah you're referring to the sarcophagus yeah yeah okay yeah <laughs> you're just about to say <laughs> yeah so there's that there's that element of of Dorman at least and we're sort of jumping all over but um. You know, I also think of uh, the Forbidden Lands sort of exist in their own in their own space. Uh, maybe like the castle and Eco too. I think they're this very isolated place, and um, you know, there's sort of this uh, giant bridge that leads uh, in shadow that leads off into this place that is sort of like surrounded and cut off from the rest of the world. And in Eco, yeah, there's sort of a bridge is missing there, but there was supposed to be a bridge, and it leads off into this you know this big isolated castle that's sort of like prison esque as well. Yeah. Um, and I think to go back to your, I think it's interesting hearing you talk about, uh, Albert, about um, uh, the idea that he's sort of been adventuring for years. I guess to me, it actually feels the opposite. It feels very fresh because I think right. when when you sort of see Emon, the like seemingly sort of the head of the tribe or whatever, talking to him um, uh, in the beginning you know, movie and then he sort of shows up at the end of the game. And I, I feel like. To me, it sort of just happened where he just grabbed Mono and ran, and then Emin and his, you know, his his soldiers or whatever are giving chase. Um, mm-hmm. So to me, this feels like a fresh thing that happened over the, you know, however long that journey was, a week or something. Um, but uh, I think also thinking about that that previous wanderers theory, I think the idea that other adventurers have come here, maybe in similar, you know, dire straits and. Uh, you know, Dormans tried to trick them and um, or have them make sacrifices to, you know, to do things. I think that also I think I guess we're we're talking in the same realm general, generally, which I think is this is a place that has existed for a long time. Yeah. And maybe this sort of thing is, you know, it, while it's in stasis on the one hand, maybe this sort of activity that happens in the game uh, has happened, you know, many times over a mm. stretch of time. That made me think of uh, the Neverending Story. Um, you know how, like uh, the the sort of portal of the Oracle, and like like there's there's the sort of ruins of all the people who have tried to pass through, like the the armor sort of sc- scattered around. Um, and this is um, when uh, Blue Point are talking about having sculpted, uh, you know, sculpting the the new Colossae that they noticed that like there's the opportunity to add detail, and they said there were only the hints of sword strikes, and and like again, people have tried to take these creatures down before, but they've failed probably because they didn't have the sword, you know, um, which. Right. Add, which adds an extra wrinkle to like, oh, you can go through all these things, wait for the sun to align or whatever, all this sort of stuff to eventually get to the Forbidden Lands, but you get there, and if you don't have the sword, that's it. Like, it adds that extra kind of peril and that extra kind of just mm-hmm. like, and, I mean, you can make a whole little... <laughs> I had this little funny thought. What if... um. I don't know, Marvel or Disney acquired, I don't know, this is terrible, but um, a little sub-story, <laughs> sub-story of like how, you know, like as, an, as a, like a, a, a mobile app game, oh, how Wanda got the sword, you know? <laughs> <laughs> how traumatizing would that be? Um, the death of like us. I wonder, um... Mini-game. Say again, Nick? <laughs> like a steal the sword mini game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like uh, Candy Crush. Go ahead, Logan. Yeah, I wonder, you know, if uh, someone came to the Forbidden Lands and they did not have the sword. Um, I did not. Know, sorry, they would... sorry I, I apologize. I'm, sorry. I'm <laughs> oh, so boy. sorry. I'm sorry. Um, they, they would have to pass through the Shrine of Worship because that's where the bridge leads to. And, um, you know, that little, that mysterious door that opens automatically for Wander, maybe that would have opened for them. But my question is, would they have gotten past the shadow guys that come up, uh, mm. which Wander holds up the sword and, and shines the light on them and they go away? No um, you know, would anyone have even gotten past that? point i wonder right it's a very interesting question very interesting um logan um i have another question for you um so you said you got all the coins right no i didn't what no i did not say that i I, said i I, I, uh, sorry (laughs) weirdly i thought oh yeah yeah um but yeah you have you've gotten a few obviously and stuff right i've gotten 12 12 so far from all them. Fantastic. Oh, sorry. Weirdly, I, I what, think what, there's like 79, right? 79. Yeah. What could? The, oh, Nick, join in, join with me. An hour podcast de- deliberating the meaning of the number 79. What could this mean? <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, but yeah. Um, anything like let's talk about architecture. So you know Giovanni Battista Piranesi. We talked about like the prisons. The you know about this guy, obviously. Um, Logan. Um, who was it? 
Okay, so um, he's basically um, uh, Nick, help me out. He's um Italian paint, sorry, Italian um artist, uh, sort of draftsman, and he created these sort of prisons, didn't he? Yeah, like a, a series of Im of imagery of these amazing sort of uh, interconnected uh, prisons, a whole series of of, portrait, yeah. of pictures or of paintings. Um, and I think that that you know inspired a lot of Ueda's, uh work, especially on the I think in the sh in the castle in Eco. Yeah, um, but yeah, some... generally I think. So is this Sorry. the same guy who inspired? This is a different guy than the one who inspired the eco cover, though, uh, right? George, that was yeah, like that's, Kiriko. Um, Kiriko or something. Kiriko. Yeah. Yeah, Giorgio J. Shiraco, or I don't know how you say his name, but Shiraka. um, Shiraka. Waka Waka. Sorry. Waka. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. That's uh, yeah, but different though. Yeah, different guy. Um, but yeah, if you like think of it, um, uh, actually, it's a bit different. You know how the start of um. There's a bit of a kind of connectivity, but you know, like uh, Logan at the start of Last Guardian, there's that kind of old kind of style of like drawing. You know, there's the um, mm -hmm. uh, the yeah the uh, um, the cryptids, you know, all that sort of thing. Um, D Batista, what he did is um, yeah, he created <laughs> these enormous, incredibly beautifully detailed um, sort of prison systems there. And um, so no, no, like yeah, the the prisons really is is more about like um, like yeah, as you said, eco there. But there's the the architecture is is definitely like it's it's incomprehensible. Um, and I want to talk about the bridge, which is so iconic now, um, and throw it around to you guys there. So for me, when I saw this, it just felt um, like uh, yeah, like these these you know the struts leaning on each other, you know, and again connotations of like you know um, repetition and like this has been this way for ages, years of millennia upon millennia, and um, and yeah, so I just wanted to get your th your thoughts on um, the just yeah like the, the the general look of what they decided. I mean, I know that there's you could almost say there's the same mason so to speak created all these castles both for I mean for all three Last Guardian, um, Eco and um, and Shadow of the Colossus. But um, any kind of thoughts on on the choices that were made um, with that with the game, uh, Nick? Um, I guess I, I tend to think about that uh, less so in the in the world of the game, um, uh, and just when you were talking about it just now, and and more in the, uh, the actual development team because I ended up talking about that with them a bit uh, in Last Guardian and just asking like there are all these sort of um, you know just like staircases and archways and and pillars and all these different pieces of architecture that that has a thread through their games and. Um, and, and for Ueda especially, and it's I was sort of like poking them like, well, is this what it you know what do they represent to you? Why do you keep coming back to this imagery? And yeah. it really just turned out that I think this is largely just images that they that they like and that they find you know expressive and and yeah. like working in that medium. And I think um, that sort of like taste and art direction has carried through the games. And uh, I think you know I, now that I know that, I guess it makes me think that it's less about some uh, you know interworld connection in the games, but but uh, you know it's certainly not worth you know don't rule anything out, of course, too. So it is interesting to think about some some ancient architect sort of like you know sculpting out the shrine of worship and the you know um, the castle in Nico and everything in shadow and or in um, yeah castle in Nico and everything in the last guardian. So yeah. certainly there's lots of like you know geometric similarities. Yeah, um, and I want to throw it to you. Uh, thanks for that, Nick. Um, I want to throw it to you, uh, Logan, um, based on anything that either myself or Nick said. Go. Uh, it this just gives me the memory of um, you know, when I played when I first played Shadow of the Colossus in two thousand five, I was um like twelve or thirteen, and um, I didn't even really get to the end, and and so by the next time I played it, uh, when when the remaster version came out. Uh, I didn't remember too much of it, and I remember in my mind, I remembered the the bridge as being like miles long. Like I remember, yeah. like in in the intro, there being this cutscene of like Wander just like walking across this like huge yeah. desert. There's like <laughs> nothing except except this bridge, um, and I was kind of disappointed to find out that it that it wasn't as long as that when I played the game again. But well, that's just I, yeah. Have you have you made it up the up the shrine and ran across the bridge? No, no, not in either version. Actually, I've never done. Okay, that. so so if you're doing the sort of climb up to the secret garden, um, when you get to the uh, you know, the sort of top where it levels off, before you go up, sort of to the the left or or wanders right, um, up to the garden, you can actually run across the whole bridge. Um, and it's interesting because when you do it, it it does feel like it. I think it takes like 15 minutes of real life wow. time of running. So it. <laughs> When you're actually doing it, it does feel massive. I guess you get a taste of it maybe running across the forbidden lands underneath it, although there's not quite of a clear path. But um, and it's just interesting being out there. And I write about it a bit in my book, but like being up there, um, at least playing the PS3 version. And I'm really curious to see if you can still do that. I presume you can on the on the PS4 yeah. version, but um, 
you know, running long enough, a few interesting things happen where you can sort of see Agro far below the whole time, sort of like uh-huh. a little dot moving, and and uh, the the it's so he's so small that the animation sometimes just turns into like this little like jumpy black line <laughs> that follows you, uh, and then eventually the sound cut out completely. When I was up there, mostly it's just the, you hear the wind, but then it just like went silent. Uh, it seemed like you're sort of like pushing the game to its limits in a way, especially on the previous versions. Uh-huh. And then if you get to the other end, there's sort of the this like little um like crevasse between two statues that wander enters in the beginning of the game and that's still there uh but there's like a wind pushing you back so you can't go through it because you just sort of oh. get forced back and knocked over um but it's interesting yeah because it it uh i mean i know what you mean it's like that feels representative of like growing up generally where spaces and things you thought were huge like mm-hmm. when you were it are not the same when you're an adult but it is interesting actually running the whole thing and having it feel huge and there's <laughs> an interesting quote too from uh eric chahi in my book um who did like uh, from dust in another world love that game um amazing dude. and he yeah and he uh he had a note about how he just likes the sort of scale and feel of the game where if you're not on agro then the world just feel like it stretches out infinitely and just goes on forever yeah. and totally changes your relationship to it. Um, whereas, you know, when you are in agro, it's like, and you have your companion, then it's, then it's, you know, much more doable. Hmm. That's right. Did you have any other extra sort of anything based on maybe like we can dive into, I mean, poor agro, I don't even have any, have him in any of my <laughs> outlines for episodes. You know how I've, I, I sent that to you, Nick, the um, outline sort of our schedule going into. Right, towards right, E3. Yeah. yeah. I'm awful. How atrocious am I? This guy is, he's MVP for this game. It um, is a, um, agro is a, is a, is a she, right? Oh, uh, yeah, my yep, apologies. Yep. Yeah, yeah, she's 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 absolutely MVP for this for this title, um, and for this story. And that's really. one. Yeah. One side note about the new version, actually, it's interesting because, you know, that was sort of an infamous mistake, I think, at least amongst fans of that Agro was meant to be a she. Um, I think it actually wasn't supposed to be acknowledged early on, even if she actually was a she. And then, you know, they said, like, get on top of him in the original version. Mm-hmm. So everyone thought Agro was male. But <laughs> in the new version, they did take the pronoun out of it. So there isn't actually a reference to the sex of Agro. There you go. Well, um, I'm glad that they did those little those little repairs there, so to speak. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, okay. Well, we sort of ruminated a bit on uh, yeah, just the sort of setting and such. Um, the we talked about like um, art direction a bit in sort of the lead up. We talked about um, the choice in sort of lighting and everything uh, with um, how they laid out the forbidden lands. And and again, um, I'm sort of again sort of weaving it into this episode for, for listeners that um, by now should already have downloaded your book um, while they're listening. <laughs> But um, needless to say, at the beginning, you, you discuss how like there are ses- there are sections of the Forbidden Lands. They literally lead nowhere. It's just setting. It's just dressing. Um, um, and like, what is the point of that? Like, isn't there a collectible at the end? And as you said, if you don't know about the fruit, for example, um, there's literally much not nothing much else, you know. Um, and how you also discussed that that was super bold. It's like, no, we're not going to fulfill this. We're going to chuck a David Lynch. You know, David Lynch, he, he makes these shots last insanely long because it's about Mm -hmm. you and your relationship with what are you seeing how does it make you feel that i'm holding this shot on a teacup for like 10 minutes you know sure (laughs) like and it becomes about introspection that way um in what way nick do you think the um forbidden lands like in in the way that they were put together serve the narrative yeah that's a great question um you know, I think some of the spaces, too, while they are certainly like leftovers from previous Colossus fights or just places where the and, and this is something that Nomad really recreates amazingly well is is showing that some game, some locations in the game were locations where some of the existing Colossi used to be before they were moved. Um, but, I, you know, so I think some of it was just sort of the the ebb and flow of development, moving things around. But it's it seems like the team was happy to just sort of explore this space and build it out and have it be just a place to, to spend time in. Um, and, and, you know, and it's, it's different if you were in some hub world and you just choose a door and that takes you off to go fight the Colossus. Uh, mm. but I think the fact that you really have to go right across these landscapes, um, and, and explore yeah. sense of mystery and exploration. And then, so, you know, you, you know, as we know, of course, you are the aggressor in this game. So giving you these opportunities where you really have to go all the way to these layers and then penetrate them and then, you know, awake the Colossus and then fight them. It's like it really sort of hammers that home. It's like you can go explore forever, but sort of your, you know, wanderer's burden and the player's burden is that eventually you have to stop doing that and you have to go fight them. And, you know, I, I don't know how, how much of that was was a conscious sort of like mood setting by Ueda when he was working on it. Um, I'm sure it's, you know, in some ways, yes, in some ways, not at all. But it's, it's interesting that a lot of the game sort of is derived from, uh, you know, versions that existed along the way. Hmm. Uh, Logan, did you have anything for that one? 
No, that's a, yeah, that's an interesting way to think about it. It's, um, the nature is there for you to fall in love with it. And then you kind of have to, you know, um, yeah. <laughs> turn away from it to, to do your, to, to go test your destiny, I guess. That's right. Um, I want to bring up something you mentioned, Logan, not too long ago in one of the other mm-hmm. episodes, you said about the emotional roller coaster of, of shadow and that you, um, and Nick, you touched on this as well when you were saying about how the, the seasons start up again at the end and sort of thing. Um, that uh like and we were diving into like what 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 could be a hypothetical law that could lead us to this place um you know there is a callousness to what wonder is doing um we touched on this in the last episode actually um and logan came to your uh, uh um one Wonder's, wonder's defense when i said like uh i <laughs> because i i resonate so much with nature i think we can learn more from nature than from any self-help books is just um the concepts of, of balance of of, uh, of of something arising naturally and that like things needing to be in balance and and also the callousness of like nature can really just sweep you aside like you know natural disasters and such you know um, which le- really primes you for how unexpected life can be um, and it can also be gentle it can be also all these things and and in, in many in many cultures um, nature is sort of upheld as like the ultimate teacher um so well, I got really close to the Colossi and, and I see them as these avatars of of nature but here's the thing though nature is as we see it in our world just like mountains trees and such could the colossi be basically inventions of dormant a a a force maybe a consumerist kind of force trying to um harness nature and like bottle it and um you know create these avatars maybe you know the um architecture that like is surrounding these colossi is like almost like seals to try and kind of shape and misshape nature into these grotesque kind of like shapes um to um to to kind of harness nature in a way and could could i be as someone who loves the colossi could i be misreading this and then could they be like aberrations um i'll throw it to uh (laughs) nick man uh yeah it's an interesting topic i think just sort of how they relate to their surroundings and i think you know uh has talked a bit about how he wanted them to and the rest of the demons you know talked to me as well about how um they didn't want it to just feel like a sort of part of the scenery or feel like animals or feel like machines or anything. It's sort of, they exist somewhere in between there. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting thinking about too, what, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm tying this more to the class of themselves, but, uh, sort of like what you know what they're obviously sort of trapping these different pieces of dormant as well so what were the colossi like before they you know inhabited this and and why are they in this this little quiet corner of the world um but uh yeah i mean those those themes of nature are interesting too and uh there's a, a quote from um a way to uh, i think in the in my shadow book where he talks about how a lot of games give you sort of the the impression of nature Mm-hmm. Um, but more just sort of as a summary of like, oh, this is some like here is some nature over here. But I think he really wants to like luxuriate in it a bit. And I think it's an important part of his life. And so he wants to give the actual true impression of how what it feels like to be out in nature in his games. Mm, absolutely. Um, Logan, anything for that one? No, it's, um, I mean, you know, obviously, you know, uh, I, I wouldn't expect anything less from Nick Sutner uh, to be able to put uh, any thought in the best possible way about these games. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I've, just, yeah, I've, just, I've just lived in this rabbit hole for a long time. So yeah. it's, we all have, we all have, we all have. <laughs> yeah. I, I tend to, um, you know, my default thought is that the Colossi were created by whatever ritual seal Dorman. Uh, they were created at the same time. It's interesting to think that they might've been around before then. I've never really considered that. Right. Um, like uh, I see. Yeah. Like, like guardians for him, basically. Mm-hmm. potentially or um we need to just have it and kind of put this on the on the radio waves and i want the um nyc times or whatever to report on it it's like finally unmasked um hey jk rowling totally stole the the, the horcruxes <laughs> from <laughs> <laughs> just saying Maybe. you know so, you know i don't know how many i think there was like seven horcruxes yeah seven um, yeah there there's seven and i look i'm kidding i love yeah that's right. funny though i've never actually thought about that but you're i mean it's you know spot on yeah, like these things where the power is hidden away within them and uh, they're scattered around seemingly trying to, again, inconquerable. Maybe like with Horcruxes, it's about like how, how small they are and how unconquerable and, and unfindable they are from that small scale. But with the right. Colossi, they're, they're meant to, that power is never meant to be uh, uh, usurped um, from anyone. That's why the um, Dorman, um, uh, you know, in, imbued them in, in the Colossi. I wonder if the Colossi may have been actually maybe peaceful and, and that he arrived here to just say, well, you know, um, uh, I found this kind of help, whatever kind of sort of demonic, demonic um, world, uh, sorry, um, life and death bending power that um, I needed to find vessels for them. And that now they're, um, as you put it really beautifully in your book, um, dimly sentient. Like mm-hmm. that these creatures right. may even have been um, 
like less of like lumbering brutes kind of thing that they, they, they they've made maybe lobotomized by by Dorm, by Dorman in a, in a really sad way you know yeah and then also i think when you i mean this is sort of jumping between games when you think in last guardian about the the soldiers the Uroi, uh yeah. like the inhabited suits of armor and what that presence is and and is that similar to the shadow creatures that exist in in eco and uh, you know, there's a lot of sort of theories you can spin up from there. And I think in Last Guardian, especially it's there's a lot of theories about sort of, you know, alien alien ships and such. And yeah. um, but there is something to be said, I think, for this sort of, uh, you know, not not unwilling, but yeah, not entirely sentient force and sort of where that all comes from, because it does seem like it is all tied together in some way. It does. Yeah. Um, hey, Logan, do you think there's a connection between, uh, apart from thematically, between um, uh, Adorman and the Master of the Valley, as well as just being essentially the antagonists? Yeah, well, I mean, similar to, to the whole Mono and the Queen theory, that tends to go a bit too far okay. um, for me in terms of like where I'm willing to go with, with theorizing about the games. But um, I, I do think that Dorman could possibly be connected to the sarcophagus, which I think m- might not really be like the master of the valley. Mm. Um, I think the theory that the master of the valley could almost be like sort of an AI is probably pretty close to what it actually is. And that the thing in the sarcophagus probably isn't uh, some sort of incarnation or previous incarnation of the Master of the Valley, but is rather uh, the creator of the Master of the Valley or something of that nature. I think that sounds pretty likely to me. And that could possibly be related to Dorman. But, um, you know, I... (laughs) Yeah, I mean, that sarcophagus is made of 16 pieces. hey oh. Yeah, yeah, I forgot about that. (laughs) That's right. Um, But but I think it's interesting to think about, especially if that is Dorman, of whether they are... Uh, you know, whether he's sort of being kept at bay there um, or whether he's sort of being kept alive, like is, you know, do they do they want to bring him to life or do they want to like protect the world from him? I mean, yeah, you know, in in Eco, obviously, uh, you know, if Eco would have been kept in that pod and would have whatever would have happened to him would have happened to him, uh, the Queen's plan probably would have come to fruition pretty easily. Right. Right. Um, yeah. And, you know, uh, in The Last Guardian, it could be something very similar where once they reach a certain number of boys that they feed to this little bird thing, um, you know, the sarcophagus would burst open or something. Who knows? Um, mm. But, yeah, that, that's also a really interesting thought uh, if the, they were trying to keep uh, whatever's in there at bay. And if they were, then, man, I, I want a sequel to that. And I want to see yeah. <laughs> what happens. The when, downloadable when ebook. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to see what happens when that thing gets out. Speaking of uh, feeding birds, I'm going to feed my cat in the background so he doesn't Please meow do. and interrupt us. Uh, I can still hear you chatting, but I'm going to step away for, for 30 seconds. But there, keep on going without me. He or she is more than welcome on the show. <laughs> yeah, yeah you can, whether you want them or not. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And like, you can just bring them to do anything you like. Um, so, um, no, I wanted to actually talk about this, uh, Logan, with um, with this, yeah, as you, as you mentioned, this connection between Dorman and, uh, or possible, again, uh, this that, that, that sarcophagus connection. Um, and, you know, the thing is, like, Dorman, as I mentioned, like, he's this sleeping being. And in many ways, you know, in, like, different cultures and stuff, we de- like, nature is described as, like, this power that is dormant in a way, you know, that allows us to live here. It allows us, like, it allows this planet to be habitable, is that um, the roar of the Earth is, is very quiet. Like, it's not, we're not on any of those other planets where it's super intense atmospheric conditions where they just wouldn't support life. So, um, but she does kind of rear her head and that's what all these, these colossi, so, so to speak, represent. But more than that, it's it's about like Dorman really possessing them. Um, do you think, as well as his power being housed there, do you think each of those creatures, like they actually contain a bit a, a piece of Dorman or is that just a, a different kind of power? Yeah, I mean, I, I think Dorman has a line near the end of the game that... Um essentially says that, you know, I don't remember the exact line, but he definitely says something like, now that the Colossae are, are all dead, I can return to my true form because of that. Mm. Um, so there's definitely a relationship there. I, I, that's definitely what I think was implied was that the Colossae were created to seal Dorman mm. um, and, and, and that, you know, now they can return to him. The, the wrinkle in that that I have always found interesting is that once you kill the Colossae, they take the form of shadow people who stand over Wander and that, to me, does say that there uh, is some sort of intelligence that was there aside from Dorman's power slash soul. Mm. Um, and, you know, once again, that's that's where the wall is for me on theorizing yeah. about that. Um, <laughs> I really appreciate <laughs> that, you know, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because that's, that's just it. Like, that's my experience with these games is that, like, I like having that mystery. Yeah. Um, and I, 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 I will go as far as, as 
what we see can take me, and then I I will stop there. Then I'll that's, turn that's around and this is my we'll stop. Think about something else. You jump off the bus, yeah. the speculation <laughs> bus. Yeah, I like that. I just just sat back down, but definitely was following along with what you you guys were saying. And yeah, I think that's interesting to think about too. Is that the um, Colossus has representation as those shadow creatures, and I think it, I mean I agree. It's like uh, you know it, some things aren't worth reading to any further. But I also wonder that the other things that increment in the game, like the you know another white dove showing up for each one you mm, kill, yeah. um, and the statues bursting. It's like because that I think ultimately you know that's what Dorman says. You have to destroy these you know these idols like these statues, which are represented by Colossi out in the wild. So um, just interesting to think about how those things tie to each other. Um, but yeah. yeah, I agree. It's like that's sort of a a dead end of some sort. It's like we can speculate all day, but there's not, you know, we're not going to know any more truth to it. That's right. And I, I need to uh, use take this moment to like just emphasize, like I couldn't have hoped for again a better guest to be able to uh, to discuss this with Nick, uh, and then also with Logan. Um, you, yeah, you, I need that. I need someone that has a wall that's just like no, <laughs> like free, to rein you in. Yeah, free association. Yeah. I, I I thrive on it. I can't get through a day without like the stream of consciousness, free association, non sequitur kind of stuff. But um, it, it it's important, and I try to enforce that myself. But when I kind of dip and kind of veer out of lane it's really great to have uh yeah and i appreciate it from both of you <clears throat> i i'm willing to entertain and discuss any theory on the game it's just like that's those aren't going to be my theories yeah. you know those are going to be someone else's theory. <laughs> absolutely um uh, speaking of doves uh as you mentioned oh one second i'm going to mute and not sound like a um, chain smoke i'm going to cough now <clears throat> Okay, enough. Like, uh, I just like, <laughs> what, what the hell was that? It's like I had like a fly through and so, like fly oh. or a moth. You couldn't really like, hear it. You couldn't really? Okay. No, no you sounded all right to me. I, I, I sounded husky sexy. Was that, was that what we were going for? <laughs> Not if when I woke up, to. when I woke up this morning, I was like, I'm going to go for husky sexy today. <laughs> uh-huh. <Okay>. Nailed it. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> awesome. But yeah, no, um, yeah, I was saying, speaking of doves, uh, you mentioned um, the, there's the doves obviously uh, present. In a few shots, I think I've got obviously in front of me with the show notes, the uh, girl and the sleeping giant. There's there's four of them, I think, on the cover. Um, and in and in our intro for people who like audio files, um, you hear for a um a dove calling four times, as in the fourth title of uh of Fumito Ueda, who's on the horizon. So yeah, um, and they have yeah, it's, I mean, I could dive into dove symbology. It's very it's very clear that it's just like an innocent soul being set free. It's like, um, if people like the band Sleep here, uh, random shout out to them, um set free the holy dove you know uh that's one of their lyrics there so and i'm gonna commiserate with anyone who uh, was in australia fucking waiting for sleep to come fucking uh the tour manager apparently was like a shithead and now they had to cancel so fuck you if you're listening <laughs> sorry this will be a, the fumita be... oeda and and this band podcast <laughs> sorry. Uh-huh. yeah but you guys know about sleep at all this will be this will be in bloopers that's fine do you guys know about no, uh, no i don't Matt pike or anything or yeah they're they're great uh, i would suggest looking into them um sort of droney very 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 forbidden landsy if you listen they have a song it's an oh. hour-long song called um Dur- yeah go ahead nick i, I, I like them as a genre i like forbidden landsy yeah oh yeah oh we need that yeah uh metal la- metal bands listening out there just like get your drone on like i want nick please tell me do you know musicians do you have you connected tell them please to make a concept album based on shadow of the colossus there is a uh i think it was a band called shadow of the colossus um that was like inspired really? by the game that was actually like a local metal band here not local but i think uh so in san jose or something that i tried to get in contact with and never heard back from um but I, I'm sure there's nothing too interesting, but it's just funny. They like, took the name and some of the imagery. Oh, there you go. That, that's very interesting to think about. I was going to, okay, no, I'll make the pun. Why? Maybe they wandered off. Uh, ha, 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 ha. Ah, there oh, you go. Hey, all right. Logan, help me. Um, so let's uh, jump back into our um, segments. Uh, so we've kind of really jumped into sort of our main topics of discussion there. We didn't get any um, sort of um, extensive people jumping on, apart from that, obviously, that great kind of um, post uh, asking about like most surprising aspect. But um, I want to build on that actually, really, with um, with just this sort of these three subjects, you know, Forbidden Lands, Mono, Wanda. Um, this sort of sort of vignette that is created like like to start the story it's it's obviously very classic kind of like fairy tale kind of fable sort of thing um and then the sort of evil overlord sort of thing um and you know how like there was that book that was written it was um is it you um uh you were there or so there was that book made for um like uh Ico. oh sorry castle in the mist yeah yeah, yeah. Mist. that's right had, had you read that by any chance nick no, I haven't. I, I don't know. I've been sort of hesitant about it. And it was, yeah, me too. Um, I was, 
yeah, I was visiting a friend recently and had a copy on his shelf, and uh, it's just like the the actual core story of, of Eco isn't that, uh, I don't think it's that inherently interesting to me. Yeah. And I don't really need to know uh, sort of more about those characters. And that's not, you know, it's not like it's an official lore book by any means. I think, of course, if Ueda wants to write that book, I'm interested in a different way. That's exactly but this what is I was sort of say. someone doing this, this fictional take on it. It's like, you know, I don't know. I could, I could think through a fictional take myself. Um, so yeah. I, you know, I'm curious, but I, I don't really see myself reading it. Yeah, well, that was kind of be my basically my question is if um, down the line, as we've experienced with this remake, we've seen that this story is an, is is the kind that is set to endure well into sort of art and media going forward as, alongside your book. I, again, they're inseparable to me. I just tie them together. It's just it's just a matter of course. Right, right. Um, if I had, for example, like if Nick, you wrote a book just as impactful, just as insightful about like I don't know, like Star Wars or like um, Avatar or um, uh, you know, um, <laughs> like uh, Midnight in Paris or something like like once you make that connection, like it just becomes just that perfect companion piece where it's just. Um, I don't know if you have this for anything, maybe um, for yourself, Nick. Is there something where you've you've read some ancillary piece that has gone so well that it's so well tied in that like it actually sits alongside the work? Is there any example you can give us? Hmm, that's a tough one to to be on the spot with. I might have to think okay. about that for a bit. Um, I'll say, but, um, yeah. I, sorry, I, you know, I don't want to interrupt, but um, I've I've had that feeling with music. Uh, you know, with oh. certain works, I think everyone probably has certain songs that they hear and they go, wow, this really reminds me of uh, this movie I saw or this game I played. Yeah. But yeah, having having something that's not a piece of music, I don't yeah, I would no, have that's to think a, about that, too. Yeah, that's, a, that's actually a super great point. Though. I think if you expand it a bit and think about it that way, yeah, I absolutely agree. There's like some, uh, you know, a lot of soundtracks that I think endure well past the movie for me, like something like the social network, like I think is a great movie, but I think the soundtrack is phenomenal and um, it's sort of a regular thing for me. And um, it sort of brings you back to the the feel of the movie, but it, it you know, but I don't know, but not, not only is it this company meant, but it's, it sort of has a longer life than the core thing. Um, uh, yeah, sorry. I had yeah. something else I was going to say, but I just fell away. That's okay. It'll come back to you. Um, and oh, yeah. oh, sorry. Yeah. Go, I was going to ask Logan if you, if you had read any of the 33 and a third books. Oh. Um, no, you know what? My brother has read a ton of those, and I think he's going to send me a couple in the mail. Uh, I think he was going to send me Andrew WK, I Get Wet, and uh, the <laughs> oh, one nice. they made for the um, yeah for the original Super Mario Brothers soundtrack, which sounds really cool. Oh, cool! Um, yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah, I'd I'd like to get into some of those. I've mm -hmm. never actually read one, but that's you know obviously what inspired the Boss Five book series, and I think yeah, that yeah. is a good example for some people of yeah of this piece of supporting work that really does dive into and and complement the original piece. Yeah, I mean we um, had an interview not long ago on our main show, which we'd love to have you on, Nick, if you ever want to uh, jump on. It's um where I was discussing um, making uh, just cross cross media sort of thing. He is this um his name is Justin Dressler. He's creating a, a title um, based off of an album by The Sword, you know, Age of Winters. Oh, and, cool. Yeah, he's taking all the lyrics and he's breaking it down. Is like there's a lyric, uh, you know, Slayer of the Spider Priest, you know, Spiller of the Silver Blood, and now he's made that an item in the game, like oh the Silver Blood, blah blah blah, <laughs> you know. Uh, and I was like, that's an untapped that's... frontier. Go ahead. That's funny. Another thing that all it's all tied together is the drummer for the sword. Actually, in recent years, was the drummer for my my like favorite band of all time. Oh, shut um, up. <laughs> that I had with, that it was in the book for a while. Actually, that I wrote about um, that that I took out um, in editing. So it's what? all it's all tied together. It's all tied together. That's great. Is this Trivet Wingo or Santiago? Uh, Santiago. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, that is out of left field, man. Oh, the, <laughs> the kindredness increases. That's so cool. Yep. Um, but yeah, and that's, I suppose now we've sort of gotten onto the subject of, yeah, just in what ways um, do the, these enduring stories, like as well as remakes and such, um, uh, it, I want, I, I'm of all people, even though I have a kind of cluttered kind of brain, I, I appreciate minimalism. It's probably why I find this, why I'm drawn to it so much, because it calms me down, you know, uh, for me to wear this stuff and, and Sky. And um, so I guess the subject I wanted to jump onto next is in what ways do you feel as though um, Shadow will continue have, to have a legacy? In what ways do you think creators will tap further into the, the works? And what ways would you like to see it be treated um, going forward? Hmm. I mean, Logan, feel free to hop into, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll ramble some stuff as well. But uh, I think I, I'll be curious about the sort of longer term reception of of this remake. Um, mm. And, you know, you know, I guess depending on how well it sells and who it reaches, I'm sure a lot of people who miss out on it the first time around are playing it now. And I think that will be influential all over again for a, sort of a future mm. generation of game designers. But again, Shadow is sort of a tough, like it's a road less traveled and it's a tough road to go down. And there's a lot of like, 
technical mastery and <clears throat> excuse me ambition and i think the you know the minimalism yeah games wouldn't be able to get away with anymore so i think the sort of riskiness and the conceptual uh you know mood of it and all that is really on you know independent game devs these days but they're never going to have the budget to <clears throat> excuse me uh to quite do it on the scale that way to you know was able to do it in so it's interesting as sort of a an influential piece now but hmm I think mean, eco you can you can trace the legacy and you can look at the last of us or half-life or you know all these games that have um you know that have sort of a companion um in your relationship to them and uh, well i guess half-life was maybe around the same time but um yeah. generally yeah again eco i think has this clear lineage but shadow is sort of you know that grew down this other weird branch that has been as of yet unexplored but i don't know that, that it needs to really i think you know i did talk to you know i interviewed a lot of different game devs for the shadow of the colossus book especially and and i think a lot of them felt like this was just this very singular thing that was done a specific mm -hmm. way that had an impact of, uh, you know, on them. Um, but maybe they, they didn't feel the need to sort of go down that same, that same path. It's more like taking away the virtues of minimalism and mm -hmm. uh, thinking about storytelling that way and about very evocative imagery and a sense of awe, like, you know, Genova Chen at that game, that game company. That's what he took away from the game, I think, is the sense of these huge spaces and creating the sense of awe in you. Um, and it's interesting, even on the, the PlayStation live stream I was on last week with Greg Kasavin from Supergiant, who made Bastion and uh, Supergiant and or Bastion and Transistor and Pyre, and going into Transistor just that being their second game, uh, Shadow was a big influence for them mm -hmm. um, in, ter in terms of, or for him personally, of like what he wanted the second game to, to represent. And even though I think I'd call him maybe like a maximalist in terms of writing, at least, like, <laughs> you know, it really flushes out these worlds, um, you know, I think there he was subconsciously inspired by it so maybe it is more influential than i give it credit for but certainly not in like a an overt way like eco is mm. yeah um there's one series that i've i think i've absolutely seen uh inspiration from shadow of the colossus in it's a little series called the legend of zelda hey, um i think in yeah in yeah twilight princess, uh in twilight princess uh you know the field of the the hyrule field is like really huge <laughs> and like there's not much of a reason for it to be that big and i think there was some inspiration from shadow there a lot of the bosses in twilight princess are real are also really huge um in a way that the bosses in previous elders were not always that big and then of course in breath of the wild i think there's even more inspiration where your horse will uh sort of has its own rudimentary ai it'll follow certain paths on its own um and there are these divine beasts which are essentially colossi that's a super great call uh that i i totally it's funny i'm actually playing i mean i haven't played in a couple of weeks but i'm like sort of in the middle of the game right now i got yeah. i got to switch sort of late and and just got to it but yeah you're absolutely right i think um especially breath of the wild i'm sure more than any other you know zelda before absolutely. also just gives you this sort of moments to breathe in these you know mm -hmm. beautiful landscapes so you're yeah you're spot on yeah um that's why i added the uh switch to your business card there buddy because that's like <laughs> I, 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 had, I had I had known that you were um, diving into it. No, absolutely. I mean, yeah, um, good, good definitely good, uh, good touch on there, um, uh, Logan with the, the divine beasts. Um, and I think another thing which is interesting is um, I have this weird again. I see patterns. You know about apophenia by any chance, um, uh, Nick? It's the no, uh, yeah, I don't think so. It's the human tendency to perceive patterns where there are none. It's a it's oh, okay. a precursor to insanity, I suppose. <laughs> but I try to stay at least have apophenia be my wall kind of thing but what i've what i've noticed is that uh, so we went eco is like close closer off experience you know more claustrophobic open world shadow closer more claustrophobic experience with last guardian implying potentially that the next one will be more open world and we speculated about this um and i think yes, the way to himself uh yeah. said that he wanted to do another open world so, so i kind of see that pattern and, and um so and i think again just like how in a post shadow of the colossus world we saw inspiration being taken there i've already got the sense from breath of the wild that we're going to have a post breath of the wild world um what do you reckon nick <laughs> Hmm. I guess to me, it's weird thinking about Shadow of the Colossus as an open world game. Like it's a big open space, but it's not structured the same way as as what you know people would consider an open world game. And even like Zelda, where it's more about things organically happening to you, which it you know isn't the case in you know Iwata's games are much more linear and authorial and scripted, and you know every moment is calculated. Um, so I'd be curious to see if if he means you know if Ueda means open world in that sense of having sort of dynamic uh, you know gameplay and a world that is reactive to you um, versus sort of the you know creating the the like facade of an open world uh, in Shadow. So I'm curious to see what he means, but I'm I'd obviously be super interested in that. I think I'd 
you know, maybe I would also be more interested in that from him at this point than another sort of linear story. Mm, that's right. Um, I can't obviously um, pass up the opportunity to ask you about Rain Over Me, which was a title that came out in 2007, two years after speaking about the influence of Shadow of the Colossus. Uh, Kotaku wrote of it, um, Rain Over Me's inclusion of the video game Shadow of the Colossus um, was praised and said, stating that it must be one of the first Hollywood films, if not the first, um, to deal with the games uh, thematically and intelligently. Um, have you seen uh, Rain Over Me by any chance? Oh, oh, for me? Yeah, just yourself, Nick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, I, I yeah, I write about it in the book a bit as well too. Yeah. Um. So I and that that Kotaku article is great. Actually, I think it's a really insightful piece. And I actually reached out to the director, um, uh, of the film to talk a bit more about that influence and um, uh, and or I'm, I'm trying to. I think it was actually the I forget if it was like the producer or the director who uh, Mike um, Binder the and then Jack well, Mike and Jack Binder. So I, maybe they're brothers that one director. Well, yeah, I guess it was Mike. I think that I reached it was out the, to him. Um, Sorry, it was one of the editors who suggested the inclusion of the game. Oh, that's okay. right. I think it, I think it was actually him then that I reached out to uh, when I was working on the book, and I heard back from him pretty quickly uh, to have a chat. But then I just never he like never answered any other emails mm. for whatever reason. He just sort of disappeared, so that didn't happen. But it's yeah, it's interesting seeing just seeing it in that context. So it was always like a little bit weird, but I think it serves a great purpose in the film. True, exactly. And again, there's that it, it really again this this idea of it leaking into all these different um this this you know Ueda resonating with with um spheres outside of the industry. Um, you know, Kojima has this a bit with like out of nowhere you'll see oh Kojima is you know best buds with George Miller and like J.J. Abrams and such. Um, uh, I I really loved reading that you know uh, he was just nominated for an Oscar actually at uh, Johnny Greenwood, um, uh, for Phantom right. Thread. How he how he mentioned that like it was one of uh, Eco was like possibly the best game you know just to have that kind of and then obviously we can't um pass up talking about guillermo del toro who is like he's 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 got all the love for this one <laughs> yep absolutely yeah it's interesting seeing the sort of other you know uh filmmakers and, and musicians and stuff outside of and and maybe that speaks to his credit of like yeah. creating something with a team of people from outside of games and he has influenced a lot of people from outside of games so maybe that's a place and this is probably some other you know, an article for someone else to write, I guess, but th that's a place where I think Shadow's influence could probably be seen maybe even more than in other video games is, is in other media and just generally creating moods and people like Johnny Greenwood, uh, you wouldn't think about it being influenced by something like that. Yeah, that's right. Anything uh, for that one there, Logan? Um, I've just, uh, well, first of all, I watched Rain Over Me for the first time yesterday. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so that's yeah, kind of funny. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I told I you I was going to do you. it. Um, it's, uh, pretty uneven as a movie. The script is it weird. Is. It's the, uh, there's yeah, some, yeah. yeah, there's some weird subplots, but, um, aside from like, you know, the mistakes that any movie is going to make when they try to include a video game in it, like they weirdly call it shadows of the Colossus, which I almost feel like uh -oh. must have been somehow intentional in some way. Cause like, obviously there was a lot of love for the game on the crew. I won't speak to that. Yeah. Um, compared I wonder to though, other... that, I wonder if that though was just like like Adam Sandler saying it wrong, and no one wants to like do Probably. another take just yeah. to correct them. <laughs> <laughs> Could have been, yeah, and, and you know, compared Sh to other sorry, sorry, shadows, that... of, shadows of the yeah. Colossus, shadows, shadows of the Colossus. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I had to, I had to. Please continue. But yeah, compared to other movies that have um, featured video games, I mean, it's it's head over heels in that respect. I mean, you know, I. I I'm also kind of sad that they didn't actually like go into the whole reasoning of why he plays the game in the movie so much, but like it's very clearly intentional. You know, in that Kotaku article, the editor talks about where his inspiration for including it came from, why he thinks Adam Sandler's character likes the game so much, mm. and that is is really cool to see. I mean, I think you know, in 20 years, when you bring up Rain Over Me, no one's gonna even. You know, no offense to Mike Binder, no one's even going to know what it was except for Shadow of the Colossus fans. Kind of. <laughs> yeah, yeah the same for sure. The game will outlive and the movie's of, legacy. Yeah. And fans of Sandler's dramatic work, which is uh, substantial. Yeah. Uh, he he stars in my favorite film. Yeah. Go what, is that Punch Drunk Love? It is, yeah. That's, yeah, that's my favorite uh, Paul Thomas Anderson film. So, yeah, we're yeah probably nice. in my top five. So we agree on Excellent. that. Excellent. That's awesome. Um, quick, quick time check for me. I probably yeah. got to duck out here in a couple minutes, but Let's feel free to go on without me, obviously. Um, of course, no, no. Um, that's it. Yeah, and and you just let us know whenever. You, did you need to? Um, actually, pretty much nowish. Um, you can let me know. I uh, like, uh, yeah, a couple uh, minutes, but uh, yeah, Larry, Larry David. Uh, uh, we can, <laughs> yeah, we can figure it out. Whatever's easier. No, I want to do a round of that. Uh, come on, let's get some. Uh, 
it's fine. Oh my god. Yeah. What, what, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I, I, I wouldn't <laughs> attempt to even impersonate the majesty of Larry. Of Larry fucking David, exactly. <laughs> oh boy. Um, but yeah, no, that's yeah. I really love that you both spoke to that. For me, reign of reign over me very clearly. I think I t- touched it on it on on the earlier episode. It was really about um the themes of you know wanting to bring uh you know a loved one back to life, which he's 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 very much not like that's the, the whole premise of the character is that he's not letting her go mm-hmm. uh, and that he would obviously want to keep her memory alive by keeping the pain inside and this is something that in like relationship theory and but also psychology and just in, in just like culture really is that there's a a, a miss a miss um a misreading of 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 death in that that you keeping them keeping the pain is to keep them alive and sort of thing uh, is to not to not mm-hmm. let them go means to sort of in a sense keep them alive um um so there was that angle and then the other thing was not letting himself kind of essentially erase the idea of these massive colossal structures you know like when people talk about trauma that like they don't go to certain you know um locales maybe where trauma was uh, where, where the trauma was inflicted because it would remind them of that so he's sort of in a way self-harming through such shadow of the colossus which is very intriguing because it's it's meant to be a yeah definitely not intended for that but yeah there's 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 an entire other podcast there i suppose but um, <laughs> um how's the cat is she happy and, and fed oh yeah no he's, he's good yeah he can't ch- chilled out so that's nice oh and is that's yeah. the, is it would this be the same cat from the photo that i pulled for your business card uh, the very the very same yep the very same. <laughs> well whoever what's it what's her, his or her name uh finn his name is finn finn <laughs> fn 287 sorry <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Well, um, I'm, I'm going to let you go, but um, as a as a as a thing to sort of um, leave us off with, um, as in terms of any upcoming projects that I know that possibly there are things that you can't talk about. But um, what what did you want to sort of tail off with with um, uh, the listeners of Fumito Oda podcast going going forward into this chapter by chapter? Do you have any advice for us as we sort of um, proceed? Um, ooh, uh, advice? No, no, no advice. I mean, I think you guys are you're you're you know doing the Lord's work in a sense. Uh, I say as an atheist, but um, uh, <laughs> it's great. I'll, I'll certainly be listening along, and I'd love to join you guys again at any point. Um, it's been a, been a great chat, and I appreciate you guys having me. As far as my stuff, there's not too much to promote right now. I mean, I'm N Sutner on Twitter, N S U T T N E R. That's sort of the easiest way to get a hold of me. Uh, I also have NickSutner.com as more a website of just sort of the work professionally I've done so far and some contact info there for people to get a hold of me. I'm mostly just doing sort of consulting work and writing work and working on board games and comics and video games and um, awesome. just trying to try the freelance life for a bit and see, seeing seeing uh, if that sort of helps some of those existential doldrums that we talked about. <laughs> That's absolutely yeah. can relate, man. Go ahead, Logan. And um, the the book is, is that still 15% off with the, uh, the aggro code? Yeah, you're right. I should probably promote the, yeah. <laughs> the books. Oh, well about. done. Coming in uh, with the supporting. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, as far as I know, it is actually. I'm not sure when. I don't I, th- I don't think uh, it has an end date right now and we'll shut it down probably at some point. But yeah, with the code aggro, it's 15% off right now on bossfightbooks.com. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. You can also get the book like as an ebook on Amazon. Um, and then uh, Last Garden, an extraordinary story is on Amazon as well. As well, yeah. And listeners do absolutely as I did. I just jumped on Boss Fight Books. It's super intuitive. They have the little drop down there. You can choose ebook, uh, um, a hard copy, or both. Go for ebook. Uh, put in agro, and it's like for me, it was something like four or five dollars um, Australian. So um, dive in. It's it's you won't regret it. And just like read it on your way. And you can even if you want to do the whole audiobook thing and use Siri's disembodied voice, you can just drag down the two fingers from the the top. It's like <laughs> an option you can do, like a readability thing, and you can listen to the whole thing as an audiobook too. So yeah, for people who like to try and put time in but nick um there's no amount of words that could ever kind of adequately express how how grateful i am for you to have come on the show you have to gandalf My pleasure gandalf appear sort of appear in the in the show again sort of dive in and help <laughs> help us when we're uh, for any of the upcoming colossi you have the schedule there so um and i'll chime in here and there to see if uh, if you're yeah available cool sounds great uh, thanks so much guys i really appreciate the time and uh great having a chat with you all right uh, logan do you have any uh, last words for nick yeah no it was, it was a real pleasure having you on Real pleasure. Cool. Nice, guys. Take care, man. Bye. Take easy. Bye. Bye. Fantastic. All right. All well, right. Uh, <laughs> Mr. L- Mr. Logan. Well, I think we got so there is so many so many things you raised that I just would not have thought of uh, otherwise, man. And uh, and and Nick as well. But uh, how did how did you how did you um find the episode, man? Yeah, I thought it was great. I mean, obviously, you know, he's he's been steeped in this game more yeah. than almost you know maybe anybody except for Nomad. And you know, they they've perhaps both been steeped in the game in different ways. Yeah. Um, you know, they're, they're like the two preeminent scholars of Shadow of the Colossus. And, and, you know, one is all about 
the the technical nature of the game and one is all about the creative nature of the game perhaps uh, you yeah. know obviously they're they're probably both about both aspects but one maybe more than the other um left, left, yeah, left, I, left I, brain right brain you know <laughs> yeah yeah and i really look forward to, to reading the book yeah um, and seeing what his thoughts are on every colossa and and uh, or colossus and and all throughout the game uh, my, my favorite part was um <laughs> of the interview was was uh my question to him about whether he thought he had any more insight and, and his answer was like pretty much yes <laughs> <It's just> like, <laughs> i really like um, that yeah 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 and like you know um i i definitely want to phrase that question in a way where like um i did not at all want to pressure him to reveal anything that he like learned from later about anything because like you know like i said later on like i don't really care to know you know much more than what's there um i mean well that's not necessarily true and i in some ways i want more than anything to know what what the mysteries what the answers to the mysteries are but then um i don't really mind not knowing also exactly. um so it was very cool to hear his answer to that that you know some stuff was left out of the last guardian book and then later he he kind of made a reference to Dorman being related to that sarcophagus and i was like oh man like does he have more information but like you know we'll never know and, and that's cool <laughs> yeah and that's right exactly <laughs> yeah. yeah i'm really glad i asked him that that's right. No, and, and, and I think it'll be really good. And, and that's why I kept, kind of kept on using the sort of the Gandalf reference sort of thing that it, so it's so it's the insane timing, man, of, of so far, each of our episodes have had this ridiculously like um, kind of cosmically beautiful timing of like, uh, you know, right before we did episode one, there was the postcard right before we did episode two, you know, uh, there was, um, you, you, I think you, you'd shared some news or something like that. That was like, yeah, no, that uh, it was the weird uh, thing I saw in eco where you could I know. go down to the, yeah <laughs> that's right and then we have nick coming in here which is i, I think it's just uh well, we'll be, well now it's like we, we're obviously going to proceed as as we were in, originally intending to with with uh, with the structure but what what greater thing to know that like say you were setting out for like a huge journey and you had only a certain amount of resources that you had planned and everything you're about to step through the door and someone just comes in and say hey take this this will show you exactly if yeah. you, it, like if you need it it's right here and it's like you know uh, well it's the old zelda thing what is it what does you say um uh, it's dangerous oh, to go that? alone yeah it's dangerous to go on that's it <laughs> yes exactly so but yeah i'm, I'm kind of happy to tail things off there after after an interview with nick did you have any uh -huh. uh, extra little um uh things to tease um uh the listeners with like with uh, your activities no, with um, land of light and dark no i don't think so um i mean you know right now this is my activity pretty much um uh you know i, I linked my full rain over me review um on the blog so if you want to read it you know land of light and dark .com, uh there's a link to my review of rain over me um and that's just pretty much the most interesting thing i posted there recently um you know right now i've pretty much been avoiding the shadow of the colossus tag but you know um in a few days i will open the floodgates and just post whatever interests yes. me talk about the remake with everybody that's right um, and then talk about those those little uh, i call them you know i guess people call them golden relics or just relics i call them glims which is from ninokini oh. Oh, because um, that's kind of yeah, that's kind of like what they are to me. That's what they remind me of. Yeah. Um, and you know, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, I guess maybe we'll talk about all that next week here too. For sure. Yeah. Well, yeah. And I'm, maybe you know when we yeah, yeah sorry when we have Nick back on, uh, maybe he'll have formulated his thoughts on the remake fully, and we can talk to him about that too. Truly, exactly. Yeah, and I'm really glad that like there was that great um you know mixture of perspectives on 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 the remake, and because uh, it's important. And I'm actually as much as I I really do consider the remake to just be the version that had been uh, again straining to come out past the you know like uh you know the pixelization. I I, I describe that for me. I ultimately I would say that like what you said that they're different things. They serve different vibes different kind of feelings mm -hmm. and they can coexist so there's no, no nothing's being taken yep. away from the other um and that just makes me particularly grateful for like again you see so much as you said on reddit and on the web inflammatory aggressive abrasive attitudes about like ruining childhoods and all this kind of crap <laughs> i really appreciate like the solid head on your shoulders you have man yeah i mean it's it's just goes with what i said about the movie where like i kind of want them to to maybe have a couple of flashbacks in there i want to see how they would do that in the screenplay pages that that were shown on twitter they did not do that well but um i think you could do that pretty well if possible and and you know if you don't like it um then you'll always have the video game exactly simple as that so man i am going to tail things off we'll go into our sort of ending spiel if that's all right yeah go ahead so we okay so listeners um we humbly hope you enjoyed uh the discussion that we had um and that you'll 
yeah, join us for the sort of upcoming um, explorations into the U universe that uh, we are going to undertake. Um, we would love to hear um, your stories, um, as in like to have you either up here on the show if you have a particular Colossus you want to speak to, and the same way that Nick appeared just to kind of speak to that particular angle. Um, I've posted the schedule to our various kind of outlets, including Instagram and Tumblr and Twitter, so you'll find it there, um, which basically leads us all the way up to E3. So I'm um, going into a potential reveal or, or more information rather on the girl and the yeah dragon tattoo. Uh, sorry, girl and the dragon. <laughs> Tattoo. What? <laughs> the girl and the sleeping giant. Thank you. Um, that yes, it's a twist, <laughs> a twist to the story. Daniel Craig stars in Fumito Ueda's new. Um, <laughs> But yeah, please do yeah, send your stories, tattoo photos, expressions of interest in co-hosting uh, to Fumito Ueda podcast at gmail.com. And yeah, so, um, did you have any other closing notes for our listeners, um, Logan? No, no, yeah. I mean, just looking forward to E3. Fingers crossed on that. Yeah, um, I think it'll be, it'll be really interesting. You know, yeah. Ueda said uh, in that Famitsu discussion that um, he wasn't sure if he was going to, that he said he like wanted to reveal his new title soon, but he wasn't sure if it was going to be in 2018. I still think it definitely is. Mm. So um, we'll have a lot to talk about until then. For sure. Absolutely. So listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. Looking forward to um, sharing more tales with you on the first Colossus, Valus, um, on the next yeah. episode. So that'll be great. Um, and yeah happy for you all to step out and join us on this kind of shared odyssey together so take care and till next week bye have to have the last buy go yeah oh i know i said i said to myself i'm not gonna do it that <laughs> no have the last buy you're my guest you're my guest if you if you were here in my house you would have to have the last piece of food if you were here in my house i would have to if there was one blanket and it was cold we'd give you you're my host man sorry you're my guest go ahead uh, if you say so bye bye, bye, bye. 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 fantastic dude what's ahead for the rest of today for yourself man I might actually go out and see uh, the 1517 to Paris movie that came out. Oh, um, nice. Not supposed to be very good, but I have a movie pass so I can basically see a movie a day for, for free. Mm -hmm. um, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, I don't know if you know about that. You know, you pay uh, like $120 a year and you can see one movie a day for free, which movie is pass. so... Movie mm. pass. Yeah, it's so freaking amazing. So I can just see anything, you know, any movie that comes out. I don't care if the reviews are bad. I'm just going to go see it. Oh, that's insane. Uh, <laughs> I love that. And, and what that is, is like, it's a it's a guaranteed, like chunk of like i love that 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 could possibly yeah. keep the freaking uh, like movie industry alive if if, if people kind sign of. up onto that yeah yeah and and you know like it's it's it, there it almost doesn't hurt anybody i think amc the amc theater chain is, has gotten all up in arms about it just because um basically because when they saw that movie pass was a thing i think they got angry that they hadn't thought of it first and hadn't um put out their own version of it so they could get all the membership fees along with all the money they're already getting for people paying for tickets. But, um, other theaters aren't even mad because when you buy a ticket through movie pass and this, I like, I, I'm going to tell you right now, like everyone else who has movie pass sounds exactly like me when we're talking about it. We're like, we all sound like we've been paid by them, but like, that's just like how good it is. Like, that, like I've no, talked to so many other people. That's all good. <laughs> yeah, <man>. like, <laughs> Like like any like anyone who uses Movie Pass will sound like a complete shell for Movie Pass. No man, no. I, like, I feel the same way about certain things, but that's yeah, great. Like, yeah, you know, when you buy a ticket with Movie Pass, like um, it the theater gets all the money, so like it's almost like there's no difference, which is like that's how they set it up. Like you know, you pay ten dollars, uh, you pay one hundred twenty dollars a month. Um, the company pays for your ticket, and then they get profit through like studies of people's viewing habits and various other things mm. so that's how they make some money on that it's a really interesting thing and yeah i mean like i said you know movies are a big part of my life so but no i'm gonna go see that tonight I, I here's the thing i'm super jelly jealous as in because here's <laughs> the thing dude um 
you know, she, like I'm, I do Death Stranding podcast, you know, like I, I know that like for me to um, Hideo Kojima, he watches a whole bunch of movies every year. Yeah. And, I, and I know that if I had something like that, I would feel that it's like a gym membership. You know, you, you, mm-hmm. you would feel like you have that impetus to like, oh, well, I'm paying for this. I have to go. You know, and and I know that I've I've just because of my stupid introverted habits, I know that I weirdly follow my like muscle memory of just going home, working on the podcast, da 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 da. Like yeah. like like there's so much art out there to be experienced. Um, and I think that that's perfect, man. And uh, I'm consider me a shill for it as well. Go for it, free advertising. <laughs> Please feel free to sponsor us. <laughs> yeah, that'd be cool, yeah. That's but right. yeah, and I, I might uh, I might beat the remake tonight. We'll see. You know, I only have two left. I will try and beat you to beating the remake. We'll see how we go. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah, cool. yeah <laughs> it's on. It's on. Um, but, dude, no, it's like it's re- literally about like experiencing the story in your own time. So, old you. Dude, have a fantastic mm-hmm. week. This was one of my favorites episode, episodes ever. Yeah, and, um, yeah, it was great. Feel free to jump onto any of the others. We'd love to have you on Death Stranding Podcast for sure. Yeah, and when you do that Lynch episode, I, I will definitely try to be on. You're on. You're on. That's it. We're on. Right. Buddy, um, <laughs> take care, and I'll catch up with you later. Yeah, you too, man. See ya. See you, man. Bye. Bye. What is up? Am I speaking with Nick Sutner? You are, hello, sir. Fantastic. And hey. hey, Logan, good to see you, man. What's up? Terrific. Awesome. Fantastic. Everyone's coming through pretty clear, which is a good thing. Great. Yeah, I hope this is picking up on my proper mic. Um, I can sit forward if I need to as well. Just let me know. No, that's totally fine. Your um, little Skype icon uh, almost feels as though if they did a Wallace and Gromit live action, that that would be a character. Is The eyes are just so piercing. <laughs> you, know <what's, laughs> you know what's so funny that you mentioned that is I'm actually going tonight after I'm done talking with you guys to the Cartoon Art Museum here to see Nick Park give a talk. Okay, so the vibes, oh, wow. are, the vibes are real. The art men, I love those guys. So <laughs> I love Nick Park too. It's like, Wallace, Wallace and Gromit. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Logan, Perfect. we need to do a quick round table. Um, Logan, I need your, uh, any Wallace and Gromit voice whatsoever. Go, go, go. Oh, man. <laughs> Vegetables. <laughs> Vegetables. <laughs> that's right. That's all I can do. <laughs> Very nice. That's a good. Uh, that's a good go-to. But uh, we don't want to cut into all the time that you've um, allocated to us. I, I love that you, you're happy with the long form. But um, I'm very glad you told me ahead of time about when you um, when you're able to. Yeah, when you have to sort of jump off. So let us crack on. Cool. I'll do a three, two, sure. one, and we'll go for it. Um, actually, what I'll right. do quickly, I'll just send uh, Nick the uh, show notes. I just um, created the uh, PDF because. Okay, you're sending it through Skype. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. That's happening. We've naturally gravitated to Mr. Sutner. It just sounds like like a hotel manager, like Mr. Sutner, Mr. Sutner. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, yeah, I just followed your lead on that. Yeah, <laughs> but as long as you don't mind, we we are we we kind of just like yeah. Is that cool? <laughs> uh, it's as as formal as you want to get here. You can sure. call me Mr. Sutner or I'm Nick like, or anything in between. Like Nick, sir, it's like it's so great to have you on the show, Mr. Nick. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I apologize. I and I've got two Americans on the line. I'm sure I've my social standing in your like subconscious place of like, oh, I'm gonna actually allocate this person less respect because they are really <laughs> shit at a certain accent. Um, but anyway, thank you for bearing. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty impressed so far, actually. So. <laughs> thank you. You're way too kind. Oh boy. Yeah, the the check is in the mail. Um, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um. That's right. Yeah. And I wanted to say, actually, um, with, uh, you know, Logan's question and when you sort of jumped in there, by the way, I apologize if I had been like, I, I sort of went on this, this big passage. And um, um, as soon as you started talking about the difference between the uh, remake and, and the original, I was like, and I was like teeing, I was like prepping. He was in the sort of wings. I was like, this is I, this is a Logan moment. <laughs> I need, need Logan <laughs> no. to speak to this. So, um, yeah, I apologize if I, I cut you off or anything. That's OK. We're, we're Americans. We know how to interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> Please, at any point, just like. Like, just go right ahead. It's it's all good. Um, and my sorry, quick note is that uh, the PDF, you, the show notes, for some reason, the fifth and sixth pages aren't I loading know. for me. I, I, no, 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 they're not loading because oh, okay. I I have a very um let's just say tenuous grasp of how to create a PDF. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> So, tell you upright, anyway. That's kind of you. Yeah. Actually, no, that was my, oh, no, my soliloquy that I wrote in, in, in tribute to it, uh, <laughs> multiple pages long. No, I'm kidding. Well, that's already in there. Oh, yeah, yeah, I but... suppose. <laughs> <laughs> I've, had, I've had people like on my other podcast say, um, you know, again, I, and I really appreciate it. Again, I have to iterate. Please jump in at any time. I, did, I do tend to kind of go on. So it's like Logan being like, it's my turn now. It's like, thank you, man. I love you. You're my, <laughs> you're, you're my, you're my favorite roommate. I need people like you in my life. <laughs> you know? uh, but, um, 
David Bautista, uh, who plays Drax, um, he, <laughs> no, I'm kidding, <laughs> from uh, Marvel. I'm kidding. His name, his last name is Piranesi, right? But his middle name is Bautista. Uh, prison system, prison system. Um, so Shadow of the Colossus. Sorry. Um, <laughs> system of a Down. Sorry. <laughs> what are you doing? Are you, are you like I, 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 going I, I, through some sort of th- word association therapy? I, I am. I am. I am. It's just now because I've entered that mode now where anything can mean anything. Sorry. <laughs> but needless to say, sorry. Thanks for bearing with me. Um, system of a Down is a great band, and I will put this in the bloopers at the end. They're pretty good, yeah. They're pretty good. Thank you.